because, like I said, I text him back today. I said, listen. And we're live. He says, my girlfriend says, uh, uh, Daniel says, hey, he's making progress. I said, tell your girlfriend you're whooping my ass. Every time I leave, I cry like a little baby. That's how good he is. <laughs> Anyways, today we have a special guest with us, the one and only Chaz Palmentary, a.k.a. Sonny. Chaz, oh. thank you for joining us uh, on the podcast. It's good to be here. It's great to have you. I was I tweeted something out last night. We were talking about it. I said, sometimes the best podcasts are the ones not recorded. <laughs> because last yes. night's podcast <laughs> was insane at Casa D'Angelo. Uh, we had a good time, but, uh, you know, everybody was asking questions. I know there's a lot of things that we want to cover, you know. Uh, of course. Uh, uh, one of the best things yesterday when I was talking to my trainer this morning, when he told the story about both Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson saying their favorite movie of all time yes. is Bronx Tale. Yes. Right? So if, if, and Jason if, Kidd. Jason said. Kidd. Well, we have to put him there because yeah. he's a head coach yeah. now, right? He was yeah, a true. decent uh, point guard. Yeah, Rizzo from the Yankees. Favorite movie. Wow. Okay. Really? Oh, I can go on and on. I love well, keep going, Chad. No, just a But lo- you got to realize people. the movie yeah. is, I, I don't think people really realize. Like this morning, I'm talking to the trainer, mm. and he says, uh, how you feeling? I said, good. I said, today we got a special podcast. He says, who's on? I said, we had dinner with uh, Chaz last night. He says, Chaz, who? I said, Chaz Palmentary. He says, Chaz, Chaz. I said, yeah, Chaz. From uh, Bronx. I said, yeah. He says, one of my favorite movies of all time. I said, do you know that's his story? And he's like, mm. no. Yeah. I said, that's his story. So, Chaz, if you don't mind, maybe share with us in the audience your story and how it led to you writing Bronx Tale. Okay. Oh, all right. I'll, uh, I'll try to condense it. Uh, uh, sure. I can. What happened was I was in L.A. Uh, I was, um, and I, I, first I was in New York, obviously. I'm a New York guy. I was an actor and and then I said, you know what, I'm going to try L.A. So I went out to L.A. I, I saved some money, maybe four or five grand. I said, all right, you know, maybe it'll get me started, you know. And I, and I started, like, as soon as I got there, bam, I got on Hill Street Blues. Bam, I got on Dallas. Bam, I got on Matlock. I was, like, guest starring. I was like, all right, man. What year is this? What year is this? Uh, this is 86. Got it. Okay. 86, 87. This acting thing's easy. <laughs> So well, you're no, late no, no. 20s, early 30s at this uh, point? 30, Where were you? No, okay. third, late 30s, late middle 30s. So I said, man, this is, you know, I mean, I was doing okay in New York, but theater. I yeah. wasn't doing much mm-hmm. film, you know. So I said, wow. And then all of a sudden I started, after you do the guest star roles, you know, you start running out of places to go back to. You, they can't bring you right back. Mm-hmm. So I started running out of money again. And I says, oh, man, wow, look at this. You know, after about a year, I started running out of money. And I said, well, I got to go back to what I do. And that was, I was a doorman bouncer. That's what I did in New York. Amazing. You know, I, you know so I said, all right. Something you and Gerard have in common. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me and Gerard have that. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I uh, got into, uh, got a club, a real swanky club in Beverly Hills uh, called 2020. It was in the Beverly Center, I remember. And I'm working there one day, and I'm working there for about a couple of months, and the guy's really nice. He's let me go on auditions. The guy loved me, and I, and I was, and I'm a, I'm a really good doorman bouncer. I can really handle myself, but I don't. I always get out with my mouth because I'm really funny and I can talk. You also want to mess up your pretty face. No, you don't. Exactly. I don't <laughs> want to do that. So all of a sudden, one night, there's three rules to a doorman. I'm sure, uh, you know, my man over here, Gerard, would know. Yeah. There's three main rules about a doorman. What are these rules? Here's, here are the rules. Have you ever seen Roadhouse? You, you know never them. say the word, do you know who I am? Mm-hmm. Never. Because you say that to a doorman, immediately he knows who you are. You're an asshole. You're saying if you're the customer yeah. walking in. Yeah, yeah. If you're a customer. You, uh, yeah, okay. And, and you give him a little bit of say, could you hold on one second? He goes, excuse me, do you know who I am? No. That is like, if I have to guess who you are, then you're not really somebody. <laughs> and I usually, always, my standard answer was, yes, you're the guy who's not getting in tonight. That's who you are. <laughs> oh. And that would really piss... So this guy got really pissed off. The second rule is, yep. you never touch the rope. Never touch the rope. You grab the rope. You're not getting in. Of course. And the third rule is you never get in the doorman's face, like close. So this guy, he comes over, he goes, let me in. I have to get in. This is my party. And I just looked at him, you know, this little short guy, bald with these big glasses. And I said to him, excuse me, just relax. He he grabs the rope, gets in my face and goes, do you know who I am? In three seconds, he broke all three (laughs) rules, this guy. Okay. And I said, you're the guy who's not getting in tonight, just like that. And he goes, you will be fired in 15 minutes. I said, really? Yeah, get online. Everybody says that. And who was the guy? Swifty Lazar. Now, for those of you who don't know who Swifty Lazar is, Swifty Lazar was the biggest agent in the world. Mm. Oh, man. The biggest. 
represented, you know, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, everybody. The biggest agent in the guy, world. Guy, pull this gentleman up, Swifty yeah, Lazar. Swifty Lazar. You see, short guy, ball, big, big glasses. And I just told him that he's not getting into his own party. Get out of here, His guy. own party. <laughs> his own this party. This is Swifty Lazar. That's him. What a there freaking character. That's Good him. looking guy. He looks like uh, Junior Papa Soprano. Junior. Exactly. Yeah, Junior Soprano. Soprano. Exactly. That was him. Those glasses. And Pat, sh- if you yeah. watch Sopranos, you would get the reference. <laughs> yeah. but. And, and sure and in shit. I get fired in 15 minutes. It looks like the Six Flags right. guy. I get in my, I get in my car, yeah. I get in my 1970. I, you know, I started. I was broke. I had a 19. 19- oh, so you got fired? I got fired. Oh yeah, just 15 like minutes, you said. You're 15 out. minutes gone. <laughs> he broke all the rules, and, the, and you got and fired. And the guy came over to me. The only felt so bad. He goes, Chaz, I, I, I gotta let you go, man. This guy has parties, three or four parties here every year. He, I, I, got, a, I got a mortgage. I, I got, I got, <laughs> I gotta let you go. He goes, but I love you, man. I, I said, hey, man, you've been good to me. You always let me audition. Don't worry about it. I left. I get in my in my junk car and I drove back to my little dumpy apartment in North Hollywood. And I said, what am I going to do? I said, I'm running out of money again. I'm in my late 30s. I said, well, you know what? I look up and I see my father's card. Saddest thing in life is wasted talent. Mm-hmm. There it is. That's it right there. Something that I'm very familiar with. Yeah, and I see that card. And I just happened to look at it. And I said, because I always brought it with me. And I said, you, you know your what? Your father's card? My, fa- my father wrote on a card. The saddest thing in life is wasted time. This was your father's catchphrase? Well, your father was a, was a bus driver also. My father yeah. was a bus driver. So everything yeah. from the Bronx to De Niro's part, the bus driver, yeah. it's all My accurate. father, Lorenzo. Wow. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. For people that don't know, Chaz, what's your mm. real name? My real name is Colodro. C. Col- my name is Colodro Lorenzo Palmentari. Get out. My friends call me C, my close, you know, my guys that I grew up with. So anyway, yeah. l- let me explain to you what happened. So I'm sitting there, so I said, you know what? If they won't give me a part because I wanted to do film, movies. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult to get into movies. I had Broadway credits. They don't give a shit over there in the Hollywood. So I said, you know what? If they won't give me a great part, then I'll write one myself. Mm. I went to Thrifty Drugstore. I got five tabs of yellow paper. I sat down. I said, what am I going to write? I always remember this killing that I saw when I was nine years old. I was sitting on the stoop. I thought they were fighting over a parking space. Yeah. Baseball bad guy was ble- exactly the, the way movie. you saw it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Wow. And all of a sudden, I remember he killed him, and then he stared at me, and I stared at him. And the next minute, my father grabbed me by my arm and dragged me up steps. And I remember that whole scene. So I wrote that, just that one bit. And I did it for my theater workshop on Monday. And then everybody was like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, so I said, whoa, wait a minute. This is really good. So each week, I would write more and more. And each week on Monday, I would go back and perform it at my theater workshop. And every time I would keep two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, I kept workshopping it. You know what I mean, Gerard? Yeah, absolutely. You edit it, edit. I, yeah. ed- I, would, I would tape everything with a disc, you know, a cassette player, and I would tape it, then go back and write, look at it, perform it for them, perform it. After about a year of doing that, I had 90 minutes of this show that was tight as a drum. Your own proof of concept, yeah. done. Yeah, it was done. Because... I, I performed it. I saw what worked and what didn't work. Mm. That's the key. You know, you, I was able to develop it. <clears throat> the fact Pat calls it testing, tuning, testing. That's but he's absolutely in right. Yes. You have to test it. You have to, if you really want to be sure. Mm-hmm. So what I did was I said, okay, now here we go. Now, how do I do this? I said, well, I got, now how do I get the money? I need money to produce it. I called my friend who I worked, who I was his bodyguard in New York. Uh, not a, a legit guy. Petey Gation, his name was. And he owned the clubs and a uh, legit guy. He owned the uh, limelight in New York. Anyway, I told him about it. He says, you know what? He says, I, always, I saw you in a play. You got a lot of talent. He goes, let me think about it. I thought he blew me off. The next day, I, I get a knock on the door. I open the door. FedEx gives me a check for like, uh, I think it was 40 grand. You kidding me? Yeah, just like that. He just sent me 40 grand. And I called him up. I said, you, you don't even know what I have. <laughs> you didn't read it. He goes, no, no, no. I saw you. You got talent. He goes, that's it. That's it. <clears throat> wow. I said, okay. I took the 40 grand. I got a little theater. I hired a little producer. Boom, boom, boom. I got a box office. I put up the show, and bam, people were coming from all over Hollywood to see this. People were going, you got to see this. It, was, it got so crazy that I had to move into the, a big theater. Oh, that, this where, was a one-man show before it was a movie? Yes. It was a one. I did all the characters. Holy What, I, what I said was... I said, I'm going to do a one-man show. I'm going to do a movie on stage, like, by mm-hmm. myself. So I did it. You played the little kids, see, and I everything? I played everybody. Wow. Rock's Tale is a film Sick. adaptation. 
Yes. That's insane. You didn't know that? No, that's crazy. Why, Gerard, why, why, you, am, why, I why am I here? What am I doing? Gerard, <laughs> why am I I'm so I, done I, with I, you right I now, I thought Gerard. he wrote the script, optioned the script. I thought it was Gerard, a traditional. I am so upset with you right now. Get the hell out of here. You know, you know the crazy. story about somebody try to somebody oh. cut him a check for like a million bucks so and to walk th- away right. William Morris. And we're going to get yeah. to that. So I, so what happened was people were seeing this. They go, my God. They go, this is a movie. The man is doing a movie on stage. It's brilliant. They said all these great things. This is what, your late 80s? This is 1989. Okay. So then we went into this. All of a sudden, I'm doing the... Now, here I was. I, I was a nobody, right? All of a sudden, uh, Jerry Weintraub, Ray Stark, Tom Pollock, all these people, Al Pacino, Jack Nicholson, Burt Reynolds, are all coming to see the show. They want to play Sonny, and these other guys want... They want the property. Hollywood A-listers mm-hmm. extraordinaire no, showing up. extraordinaire yeah, exactly. A-listers. Wow. After I do it, two weeks later, I get a phone call from Universal. They said, we love it. We were there. Forget it. This is, a, this is great. We want to give you $250,000 for the property. And I said, I said, oh, wow. I got no money now. I got 200 bucks in the bank. <laughs> I said, well, what, what about... Um, Gotta love it. What about... You know, I'm going to play Sonny, right? I'm, I'm going to write it. It's my life. They said, no, 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 no. We just want the property. I said, well, no, no, no. I said, I have to play Sonny. They said, well, we can't do that. I said, well, I won't do it. Then they said, forget the check then. I said, okay. They, so now wow. I'm saying. 200 bucks in your pocket. They to offer say you, no to a quarter exactly, million. Exactly. A quarter million dollars. Wait, well, wait, in 1989. You got to see where this goes next, though. On my hand to God, I'm, ex- I'm ex- telling you exactly what happened. Yep. I do it. Three weeks later, they call back. Five hundred thousand, <laughs> but no you, Still. no me, no. I said, look, I can't do this. I'm sorry. I have to play Sonny. I got to do the screenplay. Again, they said no. So I said, forget it. So now ICM, William Morris, and CIA are all chasing me. They want me, right? And all of a sudden, I said, well, you know, I started meeting with everybody, with all three of them. Yeah. So then, to tell you how crazy this was, guys, how insane what happened was. My, my car had a little hole in the radiator, so leak would, it would leak. So I, it, if I forgot to put water in, it would overheat. So in the morning, I'm, I'm meeting with William Morris. It was about the third or fourth meeting. It overheated, and I said, oh, look at this. So I called him up. I said, hey, man, I can't be there today. They were, what's the matter? Why? Did you sign with somebody else? I said, no, no. I, I, my car had overheated. Your car? You have trouble with your car? I go, yes. Uh, stay right there. We'll, we'll call you right back. Just don't move. I said, what? <laughs> so I hang up the phone. I said, what was that about, right? All of a sudden, one hour later, knock on the door. I open up the door. There's this guy there. He's got like a uniform on me. He goes, you chest monetary? I go, yeah. He goes, come with me. I go, well, who are you? He goes, I have something for you. I go down in my, uh, in my parking lot. You know, there's all these beat up cars because we're all actors living in this yeah. dump, right? I see a brand new. 1989 Cadillac Eldorado, black, <laughs> black with saddle interior. He gives me the keys. He goes, here, William Morris got this for you. He goes, they said, Thanks, don't, William. don't be late for your audition, uh, for your uh, meeting. I said, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Second prize set of steak times. So I called him up. I said, I said, hey, man, what, what, what are you doing? They said, no, 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 we don't want you to be, we, we, we don't want you, you shouldn't be driving around, you're going to get an accident, but... I said, but I didn't sign with you guys yet. They said, that's okay. We leased it for two years for you. If you want to sign with us, you sign with us. If you don't, don't. Good for wow. them. Good for them. That's what wow, they said. what an approach. Right, what an approach. This yeah. is, P.S., I ended up signing with yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. Because, <laughs> I mean, they just wanted me so bad. I mean, and you What were, an approach. Right? So and you, would I, you have uh, signed with them without the car? Or were, you, <clears> were, you, were you in between those three options? I was, but they had such wanted me so bad that you could, oh. you know. You felt wanted. You felt. Yeah, it's Yeah, good. I mean, look, I, CAA did and, and ICM did too. They met. But it, it was more of a meeting. Look, we like the property. We, This was like, you got to be here. We will Man. do you know, and, and wow. as, you know, so you do it. How did that make you By feel? By the way, these are the stories you don't hear about behind right, closed exactly. doors on how Check. they sell. You got to give respect right. to William Morris right. for doing what they did. That's very creative. That Please, was creative. Pre- yeah, very I mean, creative. This is why you're always how? treating your top guys so good like this. this? But th- I love this stuff. Yeah. This is the stuff you don't see. This is stuff that people tell right. the story 30 years right. later. Dude, for people, that, sure. to for this, people yeah. that have never been like in on auditions or been a struggling <laughs> actor or been talented and it just hasn't been a right role for right. you, it can you could be very very talented and just not in the right place, not with the right representation. Right. It, the, the the entertainment industry is so unforgiving, man. How you're in your mid thirties, 
your broken radiator broke, dude. Right. How the hell do you turn down a half million dollars? Where's that willpower come from? You man? know what? I don't know. People ask me that question, and I was just so driven. I'm a very driven guy. I'm very stubborn. I'm 100% Sicilian. And I'm just like, hey, this is my shot. And people are going. You sure you're 100% Sicilian? 100%. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sure. I don't know. I got I to gotta do another DNA test with that. <laughs> That's a good yeah, callback right from that. dinner last night. That's a good callback. Yeah, that was very good. <laughs> so you're saying you're you're stubborn. You're yeah, you're 100 uh, percent Sicilian. Yeah. yeah. So what happened was now I get with William Morris and they say we're going to set up this big meeting for you. We got to be right. I meet with these with another studio. So the guy has a piece of paper like this. I'm sitting down. There's 12 people around this big table. My agent. I'm one on the left, one on the right. The guy's talking to me, he goes, Chaz, we, we all came to see the show. We know everybody wants to do it. He goes, I have this piece of paper here. He goes like this, slides it over to me, just like that. He says, if you sign that paper, you'll have a check tomorrow for $1 million. And I, and I said to him, Patrick, I looked at him and I went, is there a bathroom here? And he said, yeah, there's the executive bathroom right over there. I said, excuse me. I just get up and I walk into the bathroom. I go into the bathroom and I'm just walking around the bathroom and I'm saying $1 million, I could help my parents, I could, this is it, right? And all of a sudden, I put my hand in my pocket, and for some reason, that morning, I took the card with me. I don't know why, but the card was there, saddest thing in life is ways to tell it. I yeah. look at it, and I go, I look in the mirror, and I go, fuck it. And I walk back out, and I sit down, and I said, uh, <clears throat> well... I'll sign that paper, and they all were like, you could see they were getting really giddy. And I said, but I play Sonny, and I write the screenplay. And their heads went like this. And I said, well, he says, Chaz, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And I said, okay. I stood up. And when you stand that takes up, breath right And when you there, stand buddy. up at a meeting, it's over. It's done. That's it's right. Done. It's yep. over. You stand yep. up, the meeting's over. That's right. And my, my agents, so it's like this. They look at him, you're like... This guy like cost me a hundred grand. This guy's cr hundred yeah. grand. Yeah. So they got up with me, and I said, "I'm sorry." And I'm walking out, and he goes, "Hey, he goes, let me tell you something, Chaz. You realize this movie will never get made, just like that to me." Ugh. And I said, "Yeah, it won't get made with you." And he goes, "What makes you so sure?" I said, "Because it's just too fucking good. That's why." And he said, "I wish you well." I said, "I wish you well," and I walked out. And all of a sudden, two weeks later, I'm doing the show. Crowds, I mean, everybody's, I mean, it was, you couldn't get a ticket for months. It was crazy. I'm doing the show, and then I get off the stage, and the stage manager runs over to me and says, Chaz, Robert De Niro's in your dressing room. He, he snuck in there after the show. He's waiting for you. I go, Robert De Niro? Bob De Niro. I said, Robert De Niro? Robert De Niro. He goes, yeah. So I walk into my dressing room, and there's Bob sitting there. You know, he's sitting there. He's going, you know, he goes, uh, that's the greatest one-man show I ever saw. I said, well, thanks, Bob. He goes, you did a movie. That's a movie. And I went, yeah. And he went, he goes, let me talk to you about what I want to do. And I just looked at him, and I said, okay. He goes, look, if you end up selling this thing, they're going to come to me anyway. He goes, but, you know, he had a nice approach to me. But but I wasn't going to sell it. Wait, wait. <clears throat> he says, if they end up selling, they're going to come to me, yeah. Bob, anyway. Yeah, he Meaning goes, they're going to give me the job. Yeah, he goes, yeah. if you sell this thing. Yeah. To a studio, they're going to come to me. So he goes, but I'm going to tell you something right now. He goes, I know what you want. He goes, I think you'll be great as Sonny. And I think you should write this screenplay because it's your life. He's an actor. He knows. He knows. He goes, it'll be honest and nobody will yeah. sanitize he and knows. water it down. He goes, it'll be real. He goes, I'll direct it and I'll play your father. No shit. He goes, and we'll, you know, we'll be together and nobody will touch it. And he went... And he went like that, and he goes, if you shake my hands, that's the way it'll be. I shook his hand, and that's what happened. And Bob De Niro came in. Now that's like, how you make an offer like you can't Batman. refuse. Yeah, exactly. That's wow. how you and done. I ended up getting more than the million, and played Sonny, and wrote the screenplay. And not only that, you did so good in that role, Unusual Suspects, right. Analyze This, well, your that, whole that, career that, My whole career was right. That was my whole career. Talk about right betting on yourself. Yeah, Holy. you get, you got to realize, though, there's so many lessons in the movie Bronx Tale. Like, yeah. there are so... It's not like one or two or three. Yeah. It's nonstop. And sometimes, 
uh, when when you make a movie and you try too hard to put the message in yes. the movie, you lose the Comes entertainment preachy. factor. Absolutely. But you got both of that. You got the right. story and the lessons. Now, why why did you want to play Sonny? Why didn't you want to play your dad? I, but I I knew because Sonny I knew was the flashy part, and I knew I didn't want to play my dad. I I just Sonny was the character that I loved. It was because he was so. Sonny was a strange guy. He was really a rough. He was he, he was very tall. Like you know, he was very handsome. It was a he was a fighter. I mean, who was Sonny in real life? Oh I mean, come on, you know I can't okay. answer that okay. question. Okay. People right. ask me that all the time. You know, I mean, he got whack. He got you know. Anyway, he was a real guy. Though. He was a real guy. Okay, got gotcha. And Sonny was based. Miami don't know the rules, man. Nah, yeah, I'm sorry. You don't know, it's sorry. Just, you don't You're know right. I'm sorry. They don't know the rules. Please forgive me. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> So what did he do for a living? I mean, really. I mean, come on. So, um, gee, was he a wise guy? I mean, come on, stop it. Uh, keep so, going, keep going. Right. Can you speak it to this microphone? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, you know, he. Um, uh, where was I? Oh yeah. So we did it, and it just, it just exploded, man. I mean, you know, Bronx Tale is taught in schools. Bronx Tale is taught in colleges. Uh, there's a book called The Moral Intelligence of Children by Robert Cole, that he dedicated a whole chapter to Bronx Tale on the education of children. Yeah. I mean, it's did I know this? I, when I saw, when I was read these things, I go, man, I didn't know I was that smart. But, you know, I didn't, all I did was write a story. Yeah. But it was lightning in a bottle. Just like Patrick said, and, and, and it was it's, lightning in a bottle. It, it goes so far beyond yeah. your, your normal, um, you know, mob genre. I mean, how many guys before the before there was a, uh, a, a you know, your electric starter in the yeah. car? How, how many people wanted to see if the girl would open the door? Oh no, for I'm you? telling you, really? no, no, this, it's not one thing. or yeah. two or three. It's not stop. Yeah. Chaz, question: Who owns the movie rights right now? The movie rights, yeah. De Niro. De Niro does. Yes, Guy. I own. I own the old theatrical rights. You own theatrical rights. Oh. He owns the movie rights. He owns the movie It's crazy. Rights. Yesterday we were having dinner together, and you tell a story about when people typically approach your table. You know, right. when you're at dinner, they're very respectful. Right. And sometimes people approach you, and they're, you know, they're qualified assholes. Which we, yeah, not uh, often. Very not, rare. No, very yeah, rare sure. that happens. So yes. you tell this story. Mm -hmm. Like, literally, he's telling the story. An hour later, guy walks up to the uh, to. There's a background. Okay. Someone's audio is up. So lower your audio because we can hear it. Okay. So guy walks up to the guy walks up to the what do you call it table, right? And he says, "I know you." He looks at me. He says, "You're my neighbor." He says, "I'm trying to figure out." So what's that guy's name? So he gets the number. He says, "I said okay, cool." I said, "Good to meet you." He says, "You and I have the." Sh I said, "That's right. You have the Shelby." The guy has two beautiful cars, by the way. Nicest guy. We're having a right. conversation, and I asked that nice question that you appreciated a lot. <laughs> and then I say. <laughs> You obviously know. I said, where are you from? He says, New York. I said, but where are you from? He says, New York. I said, no, where's your family from? New York. I said, where is your family from? He says, Italian. I said, you know who this is? He says, of course I know who this is. And then what does he say? He says, he read for the part of Cologero. He read for the part of Cologero. And got through three different auditions, was doing it for six weeks. That's right. pretty sick. And then he says, oh, yeah, yeah, March 16th, we're coming to the show in Fort Lauderdale, Brow. We bought 16, whatever it was. Yeah. We bought 16 tickets. We never miss it when Chaz comes here. And then he just went talking about right. you, right, last night about what yeah. it was. So mm -hmm. that that story affected a lot of people to know that, uh, uh, you know, the lessons in there. But one of the things I want to ask about the lessons in there was uh, the following. Is you're walking down with the younger version of you. And Sonny is walking down with the younger version of you. And he says, so, hey, you know, there's only three things you do in jail. What are they? I think it's uh, you fight, you gamble, you play. I don't you know what it was. Weights, what, you play cards, and you get in trouble. Cards, and you, you get, get in trouble, trouble. yeah. Yes. And he says, what'd you do? He says, I read. And he says, what'd you read? You said Machiavelli. No. And he says, what's Machiavelli? He says, Machiavelli was uh, somebody, you know, right. and you give the history of it. 500 years ago. And then he says, so what'd you learn? You said, uh, availability. Yes. And he said, what do you mean availability? He said, I can live anywhere. Why do I live here? Can you unpack the concept of availability? I mean, yeah. it was brief, but I'm curious to know about it more yeah. from you. Yeah, what happened was the wise guys, especially Sonny, he read Machiavelli in jail, but not just him. Wise guys have read. Sure, it's, it's, a it's thing mandatory. That they talk, it's mandatory, yeah. right? So, and when he explained it to me, I was like, I, I and I, I didn't read it back. I read a little bit back then, but when I started researching it, when I was writing the thing, what I did was I took the Machiavelli principle and I made it into his street language. So what I did was, where he goes availability. What, what, let's say, well, this is actually right from the play. I said, availability. He goes, yeah, availability. He goes, I can live anywhere I want to live. Why do you think I live here? He goes, availability. He, mm -hmm. goes, he, goes, he goes, you see me. He goes, uh, 
well, I'm trying to think how he does. He goes availability. He goes because the people that's he goes a, he goes a boss always has to be available. What a freaking lie! Always he goes because the people that see me here every day that are on my side, they feel safe. Mm-hmm. Be, they feel safe. Do he, you realize how right? powerful this is? And he's saying that they feel safe because they know I love them. But the people that want to do otherwise, they think twice because they fear me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the people that want to hurt him, that he, when he's around there, it's different. <laughs> I mean, w- what I did was I took it next and, level I put it, and I, put it, I, and I put it into street terms. Right. And then in that scene, correct me if I'm wrong, C asked back, well, is it better to be loved or feared? Is it better to feared? be loved or feared? Exactly. And that's, he asked that question. And this is a very big topic on this movie. Right. He goes, is it better to be loved or feared? And he says, that's a good question. He goes... Um, what, what he says to me, he goes, he goes, that's a good question. He goes, f- he goes, in my world, it's better to be feared. Right. Because trouble is like a cancer. When mm-hmm. it's small like this, it's easy to cut yeah. out and get rid of. But when you're not around to see the trouble, it gets bigger mm-hmm. and bigger and bigger. And then it eats the hole. You know, he and then you say the them. trick is Fear not longer. to be hated. Not, because that's right. Then yeah. he goes, the trick is not to be hated. Right. He Remember goes, that's scene. why I treat my men well, right. but not too well. Yeah, exactly. I give them too much, then they become independent for yes. me. Mm-hmm. I give them just enough where they need me, but they don't, don't hate, hate me. me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. awesome. I mean, it's I you know, gotta tell you powerful. Else, too. This is the first movie, the first movie in my life, back in the day with VHS. My father actually woke me up from sleep and said, come on, you got to come see this. And he dragged me out. We had just moved out of Brooklyn. We were in Jersey. And he played the scene about, you know, the working man. The working man is yeah, a sucker. sucker. A whole powerful scene right. with De Niro. But also, he swears to God to this day. My father was a Brooklyn Mariner and a, and a Garrison Beach Husky. And he swears to God from this day that that scene with the bikers yes. comes from the Garrison Beach, what they what they Let bust me tell you up. something. You hear that? When I hear that? I hear that 20 times a year. <laughs> this came from uh, 189th Street. Or this came from Queens. Yeah, I know that story. Mm-hmm. And I go, no, it didn't. No. Maybe no. your thing happened there, but no, this happened here. I was sitting at the bar. This happened. You know. So everybody says that. Yeah. Everybody says that. Oh, so, Sonny, in that scene that Pat references with the Machiavelli scene and everything like that, prior to that, like literally the minute before that, uh, your dad, Robert De Niro, drops Sonny, uh, drops C off on the bus. He sees right. you across the street and he sees Louis Dumps across the street. Where's my $20? Right. And you say, what, you, this is your friend? You like this guy? Well, no, he, he says, no, he's an asshole. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and he says, <laughs> forget the 20. Yeah. And I'm like, what? He goes, look, look at it this way. It costs you $20 to get rid of him. To get rid of him, to get rid of him out gonna, of your life. Yeah. He's never going to bother you again. He's never going to ask yeah. you for money again. He's out of your life for $20. Forget exactly. about it. Exactly. He says, and you got off cheap. You got off cheap. We were it. talking about this last night about <clears throat> having to pay for situations where right. you know things could get ugly and it's like, you know, in this case, twenty bucks you got off cheap. Maybe right. fifty grand you get off cheap. Right. You know, hundred grand. The story you told, you could have got off cheap. Yeah. What's the money lesson of that? It's just you cut your losses, basically. You cut your losses, and you know what? He's no. He can't ask you for money again, mm-hmm. ever. You got to be Machiavelli on these guys. Look, I knew my friends. I knew my friends. I was doing all this in Hollywood. This is a funny story. I'm doing all this in Hollywood, right? I knew my friends were going to ask me for money because it was going to be in the newspapers. Mm-hmm. It was going to when be you a, got the million. When I got the mil- oh, I got more than a million. Okay. Were they all, yeah. Now were they offering you money when you had a broken radiator? Oh, that's right. the other side of it. So I called. Oh, I called the, my friends up before all this hit big, yeah. and I went, you know, uh, you know, I'm doing okay, but I need. Listen to me. Is it possible you could lend me ten grand? Get out of here. Now I knew there was you no set them up. way. No way they could give me ten grand. They were married guys, you know. Yeah, the chaz. I can't. I got kids. I I totally understand. I don't worry about it. You know, I'm just a little desperate right now. Call all five of them, seven of them up. Wow. And they asked them for money. Boom. As soon as I got the check, they couldn't ask me for money. <laughs> of course, <laughs> you Machiavelli. I Machiavelli. You Machiavelli. Wow. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so what's that? They called me up and they said, hey, yeah, congratulations. I said, hey, yeah, it all worked out. I didn't need the 10 grand. Thanks for <laughs> oh my God. That's awesome. There, there's wow. A guy, I, won't, I won't tell you who it is, but there's, the only thing I've ever heard that even remotely comes close to that, there's a guy I played ball <laughs> so with. Sick. He He had been divorced twice and was about to get divorced for the third time, so he was a veteran, okay? Yeah. So he calls every single divorce, divorce lawyer in the state so that – when he when he files for divorce, his wife at the time 
cannot get a divorce lawyer oh, now because right. he's he's already entered into it's conversations yes. with wow. him. So he literally took two days of his life and called a thousand attorneys. Veteran. Because <laughs> this right. was his third time. I was like, bro. You really wanted out of that man. Well, he's an experienced yeah. divorcer. Right? If, if <laughs> yeah. it's your third one, he knows so what he's doing. None of those guys could even they couldn't attempt ask to ask you because they already I, said no. One guy did, but. One well, hey, you right. didn't give me the 10 grand right. I asked you. Now you need yeah, 10 grand. Yeah. I said, no, oh, you want money now. When I ask you, <laughs> he goes, oh, come on. I, could. I said, no, no, I can't do it, man. I you can't afford it, Chess. That's awesome, Chess. Dude, you've you, in your, in your, I still can't get over the fact you're in your thirties. You're a struggling actor, man, and you're you're out there. To your, your bottom dollar. Somebody wants to buy a script. They want to option yeah. your script. That that in and of itself is a dream. Right. Half a million dollars. No. No. Yeah, you understand that that's like hitting on twenty, right? Like like you're showing yeah, two kings yeah. and you're hitting. Look, man. this only happened three times in the history of Hollywood. It happened three times. It happened with Sly Sloan, Rocky. Rocky it happened with me, obviously Bronx Tale, and it happened again with Big Fat Greek Wedding. Uh, so it happened three times. That's it. That what? That where the person wrote the one person show and actually was in it and it was in the movie. Three times that happened. I'm sure, and it happened a few more times and it didn't end up well, though. No, no. I at this level. Yeah. That's yeah. What you yeah. I'm talking about at this level. Yeah. yeah. At this yeah. level. Success. Sure. Success. Where was yeah. success? And then you turn it into, you've been in some of the most insane ensembles in the history yeah. of film. I mean, unusual. Yeah. Su how did Unusual Suspects come about? No, they just called me up and they said, look, they want to offer you the role. And uh, I was like really excited by that. You know, he saw Bronx Tale. He said, oh, you'll be, you'd be great as that. Yeah. And, and I said, great. You know, okay. And What was your character's name? It was the police. Uh, Agent, Agent Kuyan. Kuyan. Yeah, Kuyan. exactly. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? I was in a room with Kevin. I was doing another movie. Jade. Was it Jade? Yeah, Jade right after that. So what they did was they put me in a room with Kevin Spacey. For ten days, and we did the we did all our scenes, and then I left, and then they started the movie. Mm. Okay, listen, strange. the final scene where you dropped a cup of coffee. Oh, yeah. spoiler okay. alert! <laughs> well, I'm not going to say nothing. Yeah. If you haven't seen no, Usual Suspects know, like, at this know. point, yeah, I mean, yeah. you dropped a an orca fat, and uh, yeah. and everything that's going on. I was in a barbershop quartet, and the right. music, and Verbal Kent is walking, right. and he's doing his thing. Top five scene of all time. Yeah. I mean, seriously. They, they say yeah. it's one of the top I, I watch that, and you get the all the. You ever heard? I get all the feels. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It gives you, you all the feels, yeah. man. That, that, but by the way, this this is the great yes. thing. I like when I see movies like that. I like to bring friends over who have never seen it because I just oh want to watch God. their yes. reaction. Right. Yes. I want to see because I remember my reaction yes. the first time when yeah. I saw yeah. that yeah. scene. I watched that scene this morning just to. Rem I I get like sick, teared up yeah. still. I mean, Benicio yeah. del Toro, if, Kevin Spacey, Gabriel Byrne. I mean, but if you guys have not seen Usual. Suspects. Oh, I gotta see it. You yeah. gotta watch the whole yeah, thing. It's a great movie. Kaiser Analyze shows it, this. and the final yeah. scene is so ridiculous. That's well, a great script. Look at what it won the, the Academy thing. Award. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the director Brian Singer was brilliant. The music was brilliant. You know the yeah. actors. You know, it was one of those things. Everything just came together, man. Well, Kevin gotta, Pollack. Kevin Pollack. Yeah. People don't know that he's actually a funny guy. He's comedian, very, right? Kevin, funny guy. Oh, very yeah. funny. Yeah, hilarious. Very right? That's who we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, exactly. With, uh, like, what's his name? Yeah, what's his Kevin name? Pollack. Yeah, Kevin Pollack. Now, great. let me ask you because uh, great line in Entourage is it's not the movies you do that bomb that kill you. It's the movies that you pass up on. And I, I'm a big Will Smith fan, and he was telling a story. You're huge on TikTok. You're getting massive on TikTok. Yeah, I know. Will Smith was telling a story about how he turned down the role of Neo. For people that don't know, in The Matrix, The Matrix is rebooting, it's coming back oh, out. really? The role of Neo was written for Will Smith and the Wachowski brothers at the time. They pitched him this movie about, and he was like, so wait, I'm like, Ninja Jesus? I don't I don't get it. Like, this doesn't make any sense. And he's like, and it came down to he wanted to do a song for the movie. Right. And they were like, it's not really that kind of movie. This ain't the Wild West. So he literally turned down yeah. The Matrix to do The Wild Wild West. Oh, wow. Because he thought The Wild Wild West... He, he, he thought nature was going to be too esoteric. Nobody was going to get it. The Wild Wild West is going to be a franchise. I'm going right. to do five movies. I'm going to get albums. So he, he sits there, and he's, t and he's telling this story. And it's, mm -hmm. He's sitting there, and he's like, man, that was dumb. Like, yeah. ah, golly. Yeah, sometimes you, you miss. You well, that's what I was going to want. Have you ever been offered a role that went on to become a banger? Oh, and you were yeah. like, ah, no, how no, did no. I think? Well, one role I was offered, and I don't feel bad about it because the right guy did it. Uh, and I couldn't have done it at the time. At that time, I couldn't have done it. I got off for Tony Soprano uh, in The Soprano. Whoa! And I don't feel... Yes. No, I don't... And in fact, I, I mean this sincerely. I don't feel bad about it at all. Because James, uh, who I knew, was so brilliant yeah. and so wonderful and such a good person. And I couldn't have done it at that time. I couldn't have done it. You know, so 
it, I, I just couldn't do it at the time. But I, I read it and I did love the pilot, but I just couldn't do it. So I, I couldn't do it. So maybe I shouldn't say I, I turned it down. I did get offered it. And the second one that I, it still bugs me. Till this day, it bugs me because I love the movie so much. And that was Donnie Brasco. And that was the role of uh, Sonny Black. Who? Pacino? Sonny Black no, no, and Lefty. No, Sonny no, Black. It's the story of Joe Pastone oh, and that, uh, that, yeah. no, Michael Madsen. Michael Madsen. Yeah, Michael Madsen. And Michael, yes, Michael was great. He killed that thing. He killed it. But I, I was off at it first at the time. Yeah. Uh, but he killed it. And I was directing something at the time. and I, uh, But I could have worked it out if I just would have did it. And I went, ah, no, nah, I don't want to do it. And it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Wow. So good. It's one of so your favorite movies One of, of my favorite time. movies. Yeah, and course. I think it's one of Al's greatest performances. Johnny Depp. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Johnny Depp. I, and I'm so upset that I turned it down because I love the movie so much. It's such a brilliant movie. You, I think you would have been monstrous in that role. So too. when you see yeah, these roles great. that these guys absolutely kill, Michael Madsen in that yeah. movie, or James Gandolfini, mm-hmm. do you feel happy for them? Is yeah. there like, okay. My career's been great, man. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, Gandolfini, so, I mean, he, I mean, yeah. iconic in that role yeah. as well. Sometimes yeah. it just works out, you know. And sometimes it, the right person ends up doing it, yeah. and he, they well, were the right people, so that's fine. Mm. You know, be grateful, man. You know, Respect. life has been good for me. Life has been. What's good. the matter with you? <laughs> like, seriously, just smack me in the head right now. No, 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 what's the matter with you, buddy? You gotta be. I'm great. I'm so grateful. You know yeah. that I'm playing with house money, man. I mean, come on. Mm. How do you find the the that gratitude right there when? I guess like how Gerard said, you're in your late 30s. You got 200 bucks in your pocket. Do you think you would still be as grateful? Like we talked about last night, health is wealth. Health is wealth. Let's say this: the Bronx Tale was never made. Let's say you were never this big time A list Hollywood <laughs> actor, and you just were this right. You know, one man show guy thing got going on. You I never. I can't think of that because I knew that would not happen. You, you had that much conviction. Yes. He's a Taurus. What are you yes. talking about? He's well, not gonna. Yeah, I he's, knew. Wow. Listen, I'm thir- I was 38 years old. Right. I got. I turned down a million dollars with 200 dollars in the bank. That's insane. That's insane. Right. I, I, I was insane. I was. I said, look, I'm doing this. Yeah. And that's it. What is that? That emotion that says, I don't give a shit about the million. Right. I'm doing this. And what you know, is that? People ask me. They say, how? Hard? I said, you know what the hardest offer was to turn down? Was the two fifty? I bet the first one. The first one. You had two hundred bucks. The, the, no, the two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, yeah, you had two hundred bucks when you were off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that was the hardest one because that came out of nowhere. And I was right. like, whoa. Yeah, this is actually what I, I can. This I can is get real. A car. Like, oh my god. Right, but after two fifty, once you turned down two fifty, it became just numbers to me. Mm. It Chad, didn't mean anything. When did you know you belong in that world? Like when you're when you're sitting there and 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 uh, uh, Bob is uh, uh, De Niro's talking to. Yeah. you. When did you know, like, listen, I'm, I'm, I can compete in this world? From day one, man. Oh, from day one. From what day what one. gave you that confidence? My mother and father. Okay, got mm. it. I'm going to tell you my mother and father who always told me you're going to be a star. And my mother, my father, look, the saddest thing in life is waste of talent. Of course. That's my, and my two sisters, very successful. Very, one lives right in Boca Raton. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, big mm-hmm. place. Very successful, my sister. And my other sister, too. Both of them. Because the, the confidence. This is my mother and father. When I was broke and living in New York, Working in plays, right? I, my parents lived on top, and I lived in the apartment underneath when I was with them. So I would write on a card. I'm in my 20s now. I would write, Dear Dad, could you lend me $20 for gas? And I would put the card, the index card, under his door. So I, I didn't wake them up because when I got back from bouncing and stuff. Next day, I would wake up and see the card, you know, and the 20 bucks. You know, not the card. I mean the $20 in an mm-hmm. envelope. And I said, Oh, thanks, Dad. You know, I... Right. And this went on for like a while, six months, whatever. And then I got another part, and then that was it. I never had needed the money anymore. Cut to 25 years later, mm-hmm. or whatever, 20 years later, whatever it is. Um, I, I'm getting, I get nominated for Academy Award. And I told my parents, you have to come in the car with me, in the, you know, uh, going down the red carpet. My wife is with me. I said, you have to come too, Mom. Dad, and we're in the car. We're just about to. We're pulling up, and my father turns to my mother and says, "Should we give it to him?" And my mother goes, "Yeah, give it to him now." My father puts his hand in his pocket, takes out this envelope, and hands it to me. He goes, "Here, you remember these?" I open up the envelope and I go, and I see all these index cards: twenty dollars, twenty dollars, twenty dollars. And I'm going, "What's this?" He goes, those are the cars when you had no money, you used to put them under the door, and we used to give you $20. He goes, we saved those cars because we knew this day was going to happen. Wow. Wow. 
Wow. By the way, you owe me three hundred and eighty dollars. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Chaz, can you talk about the meaning behind? Like your dad had this on his card. I think yeah. I told you the story. I used to wake up every yeah. week, yeah, and after seeing the movie, right, I was in my twenties. I was trying to figure out life. I didn't know what I was doing. I would write. Yeah. the saddest thing is in life, life is, is wasted, wasted talent. talent. Yeah, just my where did that come from? I'll exactly? tell you exactly where it came from. My father. Uh, there was a great fighter in the 60s. He fought Gaspar Ortega. I grew up in the, my father was a bus driver, but he was a trainer too. That's how I learned to fight, box and stuff. And my son is a great fighter too. But anyway, my father found Billy Bellow. It was a fighter in the 60s, Billy Bellow. And he fought Gaspar Ortega. And two weeks later, my father found him on the roof with a needle in his arm. Jesus. And he was... Devastated. If, if you probably you could probably go get Billy on Google. You'll Billy see. Bellow, Kai. Okay. Billy Bellow. Yeah. He is. Did was he in the yeah. Bob Dylan song with the hurricane? No. no. Two L's. No, no. Two L's. Billy Bellow. Yeah, Billy Bellow, and that's where the, the phrase comes from. And there he is. That's Billy. Oh, I got the chills when I see that. That's Billy. Oh, good right looking there. young kid. Good looking. And man, your father found him. Yeah, with him in with, the, at the center. with a needle in his arm. With a needle in his arm, he died um, at an overdose. I mean, oh, 18 years old. And my father looked at me and said, look what Billy, look at the talent he had, Chaz. And he said, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. That's where it came from. And he, mm. goes, he goes, don't ever forget that. And then he wrote it on a card, huh. and he put it in my room. You know, that seems like a very, very philosophical guy. Was When's he, your dad's he, birthday? When is your dad's birthday? September. September what? Was it September twelfth? I think. Okay, yeah. got it. You were saying your dad yeah, seems he, philosophical. He, he seems from from just our, our few conversations, very analytical about the world around them. You know, he's able to. You know, he's a working man. He's a blue collar guy. Yeah. But he, but he was very keenly aware of his surroundings and was able to interpret yeah. the surroundings in a way that that you know could provide lessons for it, his it, sons. It broke his heart. It, it broke his heart. And he was such a great fighter, and that's where that phrase comes from. Did that? Yeah. Do you think that yeah. analytical mind did that help you in your roles, like to get into character, to, to be able to? Because you know, I would imagine you play you play the everyman so well. Yeah. But it's been a long time since you've been an everyman, right? So I mean, I, but I always feel like an everyman. You know, I am. I, I don't take you know I take my craft seriously, but I don't take mm -hmm. the fame seriously. You were very gracious last night at I dinner. Really don't. Taking pictures. Yeah, and, uh, the people love you. They yeah, love this. They love your movies. They, look, if you, what does it take? It takes me thirty seconds to take a photo, and they remember it their whole lives. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I always have a card. I walk around with a card. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. And when I meet an actor or somebody, and they go, "Chaz, can I talk to you a second? I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." On the street, they go, "I, I go, I only got a few minutes." He goes, "That's all right." He goes, could you just give me some advice? And I give them advice. And, he, and the guy, I said, you really want to do this? He goes, yeah. I open up my wallet. I take out a card. I go, here. Here's a card. Remember this card. Take it with you. Don't waste your talent. And I've been doing this for like 25, 30 years, right? Every once in a while, I'll meet a guy. Come over to me. Hey, Chaz, how are you? Hey, man. Hey, I got a card. See this card? I go, Yeah. He goes, you gave me this eight years ago. He goes, I'm on a soap now. I'm doing, or oh, I'm doing this That's now. That's great. And I go, yeah. that's great. Cool, man. That's cool. That's sick. That's yeah. awesome. The mm -hmm. impact on others' lives. The so impact on others' let, lives. Let's talk about the mob. So, so uh, uh, the when we started talking, and uh, you know, Michael Francis and you, you had been on his show before. I think yeah. it was something that had been done before, and I yeah. called you. And we started talking together, and told you about the project. What turned you on to want to participate in Mafia States of America? What I really felt was when when you t when I heard about it, I said, "Wow!" I thought about it. I said, "Has there ever been two made guy, two really bosses, sit down and have a sit down where people could see it?" And I thought about. it. I said, "No, never." And I said, "This would be really interesting." And then I saw Sammy's podcast, and I saw uh, Michael's, and obviously yours. And I said, oh, "Wow!" I said, "This could be really something if." If this could really work, you know, if it's real, if it's real, if it's honest, that's then I said, I would want to, if it's going to be like, you know, you're going to have enactments of things, ah, I don't want that. I don't want to be involved in that. But if it's really real and raw, which Mafia States is, when Michael and, and Sammy sit down with, with Patrick, I said, okay, I, I like to be involved in that, you know. And then I met Gerard, obviously, the director. And uh, I said, okay, you know, this could be good. You know, I, I go by my gut. If something looks and feels right, hey, you know, 
Take a chance. Let's see what happens. Yeah, and yeah. you even you wrote a lot for this as yeah. well. You you contributed on the writing side. Yeah, I, I I like to because I like to if I'm going to be in it, I I always ask, would, would you mind if I write? And Gerard was very gracious, you know. But but that that's what a good director does. They, you know, they if they see something in someone, they yeah. as a director you galvanize people, you encourage people to make the project better. Let let me ask you: in real life, was Sonny a good man? Meaning when you're you're Robert Kiyosaki writes a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Right? Yeah. And he says, my dad was uh, poor, but I met this one guy that played the role of my dad, and he was a rich dad, and mm. my dad followed all the rules, got the degree, got a regular job, but this rich dad was a business guy, investor, real estate, all these other yeah. things, and I followed my rich dad, not my poor dad, right? Right. It, it, when you look at the life between Sonny and your pops, mm. was Sonny good for society was Sonny a good man? Was he doing the right thing, Sonny? You know, that's what makes A Bronx Tale so different and so why people want to see it. Sonny was telling me exactly the same things as my father. Mm. You have to realize that. So, w- this is not Goodfellas. Goodfellas is brilliant a movie as it is. They wanted the kid to be a bad guy. Mm-hmm. Sonny was saying, don't be. Don't be like me. Mm-hmm. Do something with your life. Mm-hmm. Make, you, you know, if you've got talent, do something. Yeah. Now, I, I thought about this as I got older. I could be totally off, but I always thought that I was Sonny's penance. When, in other words, right. he was saying to himself, if I'm going to do one thing that's right in this friggin' world, yeah. I'm going to make sure this kid don't go under. Interesting. You know, now that's my... What Is a that, way now, I've seen it. That, just yeah. to be clear, are you talking about the character or are you talking in real, real life? life? Oh, real life. Real, real life. life. Real life, yeah. yeah. Well, he says yeah. in the movie, yeah. all your friends you're hanging out with, they're, half of them are going to end they're up dead or in jail. Oh, they're they're that's, that's yeah. the, what, that yeah. is my actual yeah. favorite scene in the movie yeah. where, he yeah. the, right. where he grabs him out, out of the out car. Out of the car. That's yeah. the and the other guys actually look up to Sonny. You're like, hey, Sonny, we're going to go do the... If I ever see you with these guys again... I mean, right. that's power. The things right that there. he says, you think you're a tough guy. He goes, you think having a gun makes you a tough guy? Yeah. He goes, it's when the other guy has a gun. Now we see who the real tough guy is. Mm. And you go, oh, wow, he's right about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, but the thing about Sonny was he wasn't black or white. He was gray. And my father was gray. Mm-hmm. Mm. So it was these two forces. Interesting. Gray it, versus gray. Gray versus gray. Not black versus yeah. white. Yeah. It wasn't evil and good. Right. They were both. They both had great qualities. Depth of character, but, but, yeah. The bottom line is Sonny was a killer. Sonny would kill you. You know, but he was a great guy and he was funny. People are not just so. That's why Robert Cole in The Moral Intelligence of Children talks why children go, but why children study a Bronx tale because they go, well, but wait a minute, but Sonny wanted him to do well. Mm -hmm. And what Robert Cole was saying in his book he goes, sometimes e- good and evil is not so easily recognized. Yeah. It's not so delineated. You have to look at it and study what's mm. behind it. And that's what makes Bronx Tale so different. That's, that's Chaz, a- what's great about your dad, though? What was great about your pops? My dad, which, which was incredible, was I couldn't tell my dad, even though he was on the bus, he, he loved, he, he worked with, with, with black people, and he was kind to them and wonderful. And they loved him because he would always talk to them, and they always helped them. He didn't want, I knew it, wouldn't bo- it would bother him if I dated a black girl. Hmm. I knew it would. Huh. I knew it would. And I think the reason why. It was a product of the times. It was a product of the times, 1968. It was insane in 1968. Yeah. Race riots. Wars, Race yeah. riots. Ro- Kennedy got assassinated. Ro- Martin Luther King got I think when I got older, I asked him that question when I got older. I said, Dad, you know, I did date a black girl. I said, why? He goes, I know you wouldn't tell me. He goes, I figured you were. And I, and I said, why were you upset about that? Why you didn't like that? He goes, I was afraid for you. Because of my love for you, that I didn't want you to go through that. It had nothing mm. to do with her. But in a way, it did, he says. I just, as a son, you didn't want your child to go through yeah. what he's about to face. So I understood that where Sonny was different, he was like, hey, black, white, what's the difference? Go ahead. Interesting. Morality, you know, yeah. Morality. So, yeah. so with, with with you being, uh, do we have the clip with Rudy or no? The the clip, uh, do you have that where he talks about the Italian family or no? Uh, uh, Kai, you're looking at me like a doctor, like you're confused. Yes, no, <laughs> maybe. You do have it or you don't have it. Yeah. Kai, I'm just happy we can on. see. No, no, Kai today with his glasses. Yeah. No joke, Kai. You look like a professor at Harvard, maybe Wharton Business School. That's what. <laughs> 
Oh, Carl what? You going for what? Carl from accounting. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> you got the look. It's, it, it works for you. Statement. It works for you. Pat, that gray area thing, that's very interesting. Is that what attracts you to, to the mafia genre? I, I, mean, be, I, I think business is great. I think business is great. I think leadership is great. I think parenting is great. I think, I think it's very hard for a black and white person to make it in business. I think it's very hard for a black and white person to make it in many different industries. Because it, he, here's a challenge. Like, you know how he talks about the whole $20, uh, uh, the Bronx tale, and, and you say the $100,000 with me? It's not the $100,000. It's the fact that your mind is consumed with the thought of that guy that has your money. Yeah. That sucks your yeah. energy yeah. out, right? So the gray part, if somebody's in the gray, they understand it. They're like, it's part of the game. I got to move on. The black and white part is you have to go get that money back, mm -hmm. you know, because you're so stuck on the principle of the fact right. versus the grace. Like, let it go. You right. need that energy. Put it here. Mm -hmm. Make ten million rather than trying to consume so much time. So, no, I, I think on the business side, I. By the way, you learn great the hard way. You don't learn it the 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 mm. the, the, the uh, yes. easy way. It comes with experience. That's not something that you can read a were, book. Were on you the gray. black and white at one point, my and dad, then you had to? My dad's a black and white guy. My my dad raised me. Uh, uh, you, Good you, 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 you met my dad. My dad is very, you know, strong personality that he has, but he's got a sweet side the to him as well. The sweetest guy. Yeah, he, guy, he yeah, does. But, but let me tell you, my dad's a high standard guy. It's like, you know, you, you say one time to him you're going to do something. I swear to God, if you don't do it, yeah. he's going to call you a hundred times about it. But I had mm -hmm. to learn on the business side, you... It's very complicated. This whole Machiavelli thing that you, you talk about, mm. you know, there's a lot of that that applies to business. This is why books like 33 Strategies of War, Art of Seduction by Robert Greene, you got mm. 48 Laws of Power, you got these, these things apply to business. But, but going back to with the mafia, going back with the mafia, Chaz, is uh, for you, you know, uh, uh, what do you think about the mob? You know, what are your feelings about the mob? There's different uh, 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 people. I, I'll, we'll go to Rudy here in a minute. I just want to know what he thinks. What do you think about the mob at this point of your life? You've been around it. You, yeah. you get a lot of uh, uh, sometimes people, I mean, you've read it. You've seen it. You, you, this is you. It's your life. People claim you were part of it. Like maybe there was some affinity to it, a connection to it. Mm. But what are your thoughts when you think about the mob? Well, the mob is not what it once was. That's for sure. It's kind of like all fractured. You know, it's not what it once was. And it, what, what was it? I mean, could you say at one time it was, there was real honor? I mean, yeah, probably maybe the old time as there was. But what's what's the benefit of of shaking down your own neighborhood and people have to pay you money? I don't, I don't know. You know, it comes down to what my dad said. Real respect, real, real people who are real men go out and they get a job and they work for a living, take care of their family. That's a real man. Goes, he said, it doesn't take much strength to pull a trigger, but get up in the morning every day. So I see them. I Do I admire them? No. I have. Do I, I still see them and now I have fun with them. When I see them, I laugh, I talk. But I, I, re, I respect my dad. You know, I respect the guy who gets out and, and, make, and works and works hard. So a working man is not a sucker? The working man is not a sucker. No, he's not. He's not. Look, everybody in the wise guys that I knew ended up dead or in jail. So if somebody told you, if you walk out that door, every time you walk out that door, you're going to get hit in the head with a bag of garbage. You stop walking out that door. Yeah. But these guys keep walking out that door. Yeah. They know. They're why gonna, do they keep walking That's out part that of door. that fascination because that, that yeah. life kind of doesn't exist anymore. These were kind of like the modern pirates. This is the Wild West. This is yeah. Jesse James. It's romantic looking back at it and saying, wow, these guys took life by the horns. They did whatever they wanted to do and nobody could say mm -hmm. anything. Right. But if you lived with them, if you lived with that type of person, it, yeah. it had to be a hard life to deal with that. Well, the yeah. movies is what romanticized They have it, terrible right? lives. The they have terrible lives. Their kids are always forget it. If yeah. they, they're not there with their children, their kids end up bad. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about a, a, a big wise guy in my neighborhood. Well, he, I, I, I don't want to mention his name. Um, but his son, his son became a wise guy. He wasn't made his son yet. He ended up getting made. Uh, no, I'm sorry. He never got made. He was so crazy. And I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm standing there with a priest, my best friend, and this guy, this wise guy, on the corner. His son is walking up the block. Son was maybe 20. Okay? Son is going, now I can curse, right? I mean, of yeah, course, yeah. yeah. And his son's walking up, he goes, fuck that, fuck that. And he's going, I don't, I don't give a, and he's talking to another guy, fuck that. 
And, I, and, I, and, I, and it's like, there's a priest right there. And he walks, he goes, hey, Dad, what the fuck? And his father goes, what's the matter? What the hell's wrong with you? He goes, the fucking guy just, he pulled this shit with me in the scam. He goes, I swear to God, Dad, I'm going to shoot him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And his father, standing right there, goes, quote, what the hell's the matter with you? You saying things like that in front of people? So I'm saying to myself, oh, he's going to, you know, reprimand his son, right? You don't ever say things like that. What's wrong with you? Because if you're going to whack somebody, you don't say it in front of anybody. <laughs> Which is good advice. <laughs> yeah, <that's> Patrick, <laughs> this is a father yeah. talking. To, and I was like, did he just say that? I was like, the, there was a priest there. And we both looked at each other like, did he just say that? Mm. If you're going to whack somebody, you keep your mouth shut. I'll talk. I'll, I'll be with you guys in one minute. He walks away with his kid. Now, what shot does this kid got? What happened to him? Wow, that value at 20 years old. At 20 years old. Sticks. What happened to this kid? Yeah. Killed three people. Mm. Life, life in prison. He ended up killing three people. Killed two guys, and then he killed the guy in jail. He's gone. Jeez. What, you, could you expect different, how he grew yeah. up? Yeah. Right. You're expecting the father to be like, you don't do that. What's wrong with you? What's it's, wrong with you? If you're going to do that, you don't tell nobody. You keep it low. <laughs> yeah. What? And I was crazy. Like, I was yeah. like, wow. Did you see anybody? Did you see anybody that was able to have a normal life or no? Yeah, my friends. No, no, the, on the mob side. Made man, mob side, you know. No. The, okay. No, yeah. ever. No. Wow. The number runners, some of the number runners, yeah, I knew them. They, they passed the father to the son yeah. to the son. To, yeah. And they had just normal lives, but they were just number runners. Oh, bookies, yeah. Bookies, Sal yeah. Romano was here yesterday. He said something. He says, you know, you know why everybody eventually uh, flips and they go cooperate? I said, what? He says, if the mob did one thing, nobody would ever cooperate. I'm like, what is that? He says, if they... He says, we're not afraid of going to jail. We're not afraid of going away. We already understand that. That's part of it. Every one of us has done a little bit of time. I'm like, let me see what this guy's going to be saying. He says, if the mob had a program to take care of the wives and kids when you went away, nobody would cooperate. That's bullshit. Yeah, that's what he, I'm that just telling you what he bullshit. said. bullshit. <laughs> okay, so go. That is bullshit. <laughs> Tell me why. Because it's, it's bullshit. Because they're just trying to justify why they can't wait to get. They all sing as, as soon as they get caught. They have run. They raced to the DA. Who's yeah. going to make the deal first? It's bullshit. Listen, my my friend, you saw Rudy Giuliani. One of my closest friends wor worked for him, and Rudy knows him very well. Uh, and I'll tell you who he is. His name is Phil Folia. He passed away. My closest friend with COVID. When COVID happened, oh, I, it still breaks my heart. Anyway, Phil told me with these wise guys, because he, he worked with Rudy. He put yeah. them all away. He's just one wise guy goes into his office, right? He's sitting down at the chair. Of course, Phil's going to speak to him about, you know, flipping. So he goes, listen, I, you want to make a deal with me? And blah, blah, blah. Phil's, and all of a sudden, the, Phil told me his story. He goes, the guy just sits back and goes, well, you know, Phil, I don't know what I want to do. I got to think about my future. Those were the words he said. Mm -hmm. My friend Phil gets up. Right? There's two detectives in the room with him. He says, come here. Come here. Picks the guy up, grabs him by his arm. Come here. Come over to the window. Brings him over to the window and says, look, you see that sun over there? You see the sun? Right? He goes, the next time you see that sun is going to be the year 2040. 2040. That's when you're going to see it. Because I'm going to put you the fuck away for 40 to 50 years. Now get the fuck out of my office. They brought him out of the office. Ten minutes later, he came back. He goes, I'm sorry. I, we'll make it. They made a deal. Come on. Stop it. When somebody's telling you you're going to sit in a box for 40 years, 50 years, you talk. It's got nothing to do. He's full of shit. Uh, there, there are, there, so that, that's, it. yeah, no, I, I, I mean, obviously, that's why I wanted to ask you. But there are some people that uh, look at Rudy and they say, Rudy, as an Italian, how the hell you put so many people away as an Italian? You put away your own people. Yeah. And it went to jail. You you did this with yes, the RICO did. law, all this stuff yeah. that you go through. What do you think about Rudy with what he did in the 80s to the mob? I think Rudy was great. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I got to be honest with you. When he came to my neighborhood, they booed him. They, you know, they didn't like him. Yeah. It was, you know, because, you know, but was is Rudy a good man? Yeah. Yeah, he, he put people away. These guys are bad guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get me wrong. I hung out with them, but I, I didn't become a wise guy. I don't want to be a wise guy. They're bad guys. They'll, they're the first ones to tell you that. You know, 
You, you know, are there some stand-up guys who don't rat? Yeah, Benny Eggs, the old timers, guys like Benny Eggs. Francis. Yeah, they didn't rat. You know, that's it. They don't rat. And okay, but that's it. If you want to go that, listen, John Gotti didn't rat. Say what you want about John Gotti. He was a gangster to the end. To the end. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying he, but, but it, at least he stood by his code and said, no, this is it. This is it. A guy told me a great story. I won't tell you who he was. But when, when Gotti was on his, um, on, his, on his deadbed, when he was dying from throat cancer, a priest walked in, and the person whispered to John, you know, there's a, a priest here. Do you want the priest to? And, and, and John went like this. Right to the end, man. No. He already made his decision. He already made his decision. No, no. He didn't want to give any final words. No, I priest. don't know if it's, I don't know. How do you interpret that? I interpret, I interpret it like, I don't, I don't need a priest. I made my decision. But do you think he's saying, I don't need a priest? Or do you think he's saying, there's no way I'm going to have a spot in heaven? Like, there's no I way I, I can get in there. Like, how do you think I, you process that? I don't think he was even thinking that. Yeah, got I, it. I don't think, at that moment. I can't, like, is it like, I can't I be don't forgiven for him. the life I never met him. But I think a wise guy was just saying, like, nah, you know. I don't want to deal like, with it. It looks like I'm, I'm giving up at the end. Now, you know? not, not to give the audience too much here, but there's a gentleman in Mafia States of America that may disagree with, with this sentiment. So no, no gonna, question about it. I so. mean, obviously, there's a part of it that, uh, you know, some on the other side who, uh, from Sammy's camp, may say in the recording, John did kind of throw. Sammy under the bus saying he was going to have somebody take him out. So there was that. I, I don't know yeah. about that. Again, th those things I don't know about. Yeah. All I know is the guy didn't rat. You know, you know what would be a great sit down? You know what would be a great sit down? Yeah. You know what would be a great sit down? Uh, Junior and Sammy would be a great sit down. Yeah, that would be. Whew, I don't know about we that. We would need to have a fence. You would probably we would have need a, to have. A, yeah, that a, would be. But that uh, would be a great sit down. I think that one. John Gotti. Two you're saying John Gotti Jr. Oh, yeah, because, because oh. let both of them hash it out in front of the world and talk to one another. Now, the likelihood of that happening, that's, that's but, probably... But you're not going to get a, a, Look, you're not going to get yeah. an answer. You're not going to get a, a truthful answer. But what, what, what would happen is, you know what would happen is, is, is uh, I'm a big fan of a good debate. Yeah. You know, a, what does a good debate do? We don't necessarily end up getting an answer, but we get a little closer to the truth, right? right? A good debate. Right. Because yeah. you watch body language, you see one person backing down, you see one person yeah. gets nervous... You see one person really gets annoyed when you poke him in an area that's like, listen, you don't poke me. You can poke me anywhere. This one area, you went right. after this person. We learn a lot. So I don't know. I'm not telling you it's going to happen. The likelihood is slim uh, to none. But I'm well, just saying that would, that, be, would be, that would be something I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that could happen. I don't think neither Junior nor Sammy would agree to do that sit down. I don't think they would. I yeah. think there's too much water under the yeah, bridge. I think so as well. I, I think they couldn't even talk about certain things. Yeah. If now, if it people. did happen, how crazy would that be if it did happen? If, if it did happen, we would we would probably need to get the uh, you know, National Guard there. We would probably need to get the military I, there. We'd probably I, I need just, to call I just, yeah, some I, I, security. I just, yeah, I just don't think it could happen. Yeah. Now, the, the setting, too, is very, very important, right? Like, you were talking about, you know, Rudy and who, who talked, who didn't talk. Right. The New York you grew up in is so different from the New York people know today, especially in the Bronx. Yeah. The Bronx was burning back in the day. I mean, you were 60s and 70s in, in the Bronx. There was a, right. a five-alarm fire every day. They were right. trying to burn the tenants out. So, you know, then the, the, the late 70s, late 70s was Son of Sam, right? I mean, yes. like, the New York you grew up in, a lot of times I hear the stories, it feels like it was a little bit of a war zone, man. It was crazy time, but I have to say, I didn't have a. I had a great childhood. I had a wonderful childhood. So people always go, "My God, the childhood!" I go, "No, no, it was great." You know, the wise guys ran the neighborhood. We were all Italian guy kids growing up. Well, everybody was Italian in the neighborhood. It was great. So mm -hmm. I can't say I, I didn't have. To me, it didn't look like like bad. You know, race riots. The, bron no, the Bronx there was is no burning. There's no race riots in my neighborhood. There was none. There was everybody was Italian there. Mm -hmm. But it was our, our turf, you know, like Bronx yeah. Tale. We owned that, and then uh, the blacks owned from where Webster Avenue was. Uh, the Puerto Ricans owned in a different area. So you, you stayed in our area. Reggie and Jackson, a, Thurman Munson, I mean, come it's on. Crazy. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, uh, Chaz is at the house, and Tico and Dylan are like, hi, how are you? I said, do you know who he is? No. I say he's a very, very famous actor. Really? What movie were you in? <laughs> They're just like having a conversation. Right. I say, Bronx Tale. I said, you think it's time for them to watch Bronx Tale? Chad says, how old is your son? 
I said, Tico's nine years old. He says, you know, that's how it was when I saw a guy get shot right in front of me. Yeah. I said, they're probably ready to watch Bronx Tale. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I know. When, <laughs> when would you let the kids watch no, Bronx Tale? Listen, and we've I, already I, watched movies they shouldn't have watched, so we're probably ready. We and just I haven't had the time right. to watch. I and never Dylan's what, that. six, seven? Dylan is seven, yeah. Uh, you know what, and uh, I never noticed that yeah. about that until I had a son. And then when my son became nine, I turned to my wife, I never forgot, and I said, I said, John, you know, Dante, and Dante, my son grew up in Bedford, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I look at him and I go, he was, I was that age. Yeah. And, and it was like weird to me. Great so childhood. When I see a child who's, a child who's nine or 10 years old, I look and I go, how could I be at that age seeing what I see? Crazy, right? It was crazy, yeah, crazy. man. Can I ask a more of a lighthearted question here? Yeah. We were talking about it last women night. Women again? Are you going to go gonna to women? We're going to go to women. We're going to go to women. <laughs> okay. How'd you know? <laughs> so, well, you talked about, you know, the girl, the black girl you Let's dated, stay Webster here. Avenue. Let's, before we go yes. there, because that's like a complete right okay, turn. Gotcha. We're getting on the 95 freeway. Let's stay on a A1A for go now. Go stay there. Kai, can you pull up the video about Giuliani before we take the street for, because uh, Adam's trying to learn about women. I have questions. More. You want to learn about so, women? Go to my podcast, Chaz Palmateri Show. There it is. I talk about I women that. all the time. Non-stop, yes. By the way, Kai, put the link to his podcast in the comment section as well as the description. Folks, go subscribe to Chaz's podcast. Uh, you do this how often? You do a show how often? I do a new show each week. Each week, a each new week. show. Okay, fantastic. So On Rudy, Rudy says some things here about, this is when he talks about... Uh, it's part of the Italian... Uh, heritage. It's just part of the Italian uh, immigrant status. It's part of the... Dealing with this was just part of being from an immigrant family and being an Italian in New York. Pl play, play it, and I, I want to hear uh, Chaz's thoughts on this. Nearly as serious as he thought it was. I mean, it's the kind of thing you could easily explain as had nothing to do with Matilda, had nothing to do with Mario, and it's the kind of thing that happened back in those days when you had to conduct a business, and if you didn't play ball with them, you were gonna, you were gonna you, they were victims. They weren't, they easily could have been interpreted that way. That's the way I interpreted it. Mm. Uh, but he, he, He's he saw about shadows Cuomo. about it. You know how sometimes people are more embarrassed about something than they should be? Mm -hmm. I always thought that was the case with Mario. Largely because he was very ethical and a very good man. Mario is this about, yeah, very, is very this good about man. what and, uh, he thinks about the great. Italian heritage? Even or though, yeah, this was, he's, talk, he's talking about Mario Cuomo taking it too seriously. Outdated. Yeah. That whole thing about, you know, there's uh, two Americas, one for the rich, one for the mm -hmm. poor. I think, well, I think that ended during the Depression. And... Uh, I didn't think if he ran, he would get elected. I thought he could be nominated, but I thought his message was too outdated, and I, and I don't think he could have beaten Ronald Reagan, who was, uh, Ma Mario was a very brilliant man. He was not a particularly great candidate. His Where speeches we we, were more we a little late. designed for, um, Kai, look for, for what for part we're looking for. This yeah. was not it. What I'm looking for is when he talks about- Early on. Um, Chaz has a great, uh, a great. You have an absolutely fantastic monologue too about the. Uh, we can pull that up as well. But if, if you, you gave it, um, really as an improv during during our recording process, mm. about how you know, just to be very clear, not every Italian is in the mob. No, and, and Italians do not have a monopoly on organized crime. Absolutely either. not. Yeah. No. Um, Kai, if you, if you have that one, we can pull that one up real quick. I mean, I thought that that was a brilliant, brilliant statement that, that you had made as far yeah. as what the real backbone of the Italian-American community is. All Italians aren't in the mafia. It's important to remember Italians don't have a monopoly on organized crime and that the true fabric of an Italian neighborhood is the working man, the baker, the bus driver, the cop, the seamstress. You may have heard this once before, but it doesn't take much strength to pull a trigger but get up in the morning and work for a living. In my opinion, that's the real tough guy. And remember, the choices you make will shape your life forever. For Valuetainment Media, I'm Chaz Palminteri. Yeah, I thought that that was like a mm. really, really powerful. What, when you were growing up, when you were, you know, you had not even thought about doing a Bronx Tale, you're just living this life. W w did you feel a pull towards, like the, then, like you guys were talking about Gray, yeah. but did you feel like it could have gone either way for you? Do you feel like it could have? I don't know if it was that close. I mean, I admire them, but, but you see, back then it was different. Bad guys and good guys would all hang out together. We would all hang out on the corner. You know, we had no club or anything. You know, we, were all sh we were street guys. We all hang out on the corner. 
And it was very easy to go, oh, we're going to go do this, we're going to go do that. So the good guys would hang, and the bad guys would go do what they got to do. You know, so, and every time it was like, hey, Chad, you want to come? And I, I would I'd be about to, then i go, nah, nah, I'm cool, man. Because I never wanted to hurt my mother and father. Mm -hmm. Were you ever tempted to join the life or no? I never got that close to join the life. No, okay. I, I can't even say that. Did you get an invitation? Was it kind of like, hey, Chaz, you know, you'd be great in the life or no? No, okay. no it was never that. I know it was more like you, you get involved in a small way. You start doing the car. They, they were chopping up cars. You want to go there. Then you get you chop up cars. Then you meet somebody else. Then you meet a bigger boss. And that's how it happens. I never, I just never went there. I just didn't want to do it. So if, your, if your father had different values to teach you, could that have happened? Oh, yeah. So so let me ask you this question, because oh, yeah. for me, I'm always trying to find a motive and what caused somebody to go into that life. When you hear the story about some of these guys with their fathers, mm. it's like automatic. OK, this makes sense. This person's going to be it. So how much of it you think is the individual that wants to be part of the life? How much you think it's the influence of the parents? Oh, the parents. Oh, you put it on the parents. I, I'm saying the parents definitely just you, you, got it. Because it, when you're young, what is a parent? A parent is a mirror. Uh, what, uh, kids watch the way you treat your wife. They watch what you do. They watch you get up in the morning and go to work. Yeah. If they see that, they go, "Oh, that's how uh, she's supposed to be." They grow up, and they mirror you. You know, if you treat your wife bad, they'll they'll grow up. They'll treat their wife bad. It's very simple. So you really have to, as a father, you got to watch them. You got to, you got to. My father led by example. Mm. My mother led by example, and they loved me so much. I love my sisters. I didn't want to hurt them. My father said, "Don't ever let me have to come to jail to bail you out. Please don't ever do that to me. That would kill me." And I said, oh, "Dad, don't worry about it. I, w I wouldn't do that, Dad. You know, and, and I didn't." You know. Well, sometimes when your parents are do not set a good example, if you have the, a good moral compass, you might say, I'm never going to be like my father. I'm never going to do that. It, I'm going to do the exact opposite. I've seen Billy's father, and that's the man that I right. want to emulate. And that's some hard. people go down a different road. That's hard. Show me, yeah. show me people who could do that. That was me. I, yeah. I yeah. did not have a good relation with my father. He was doing some things I didn't agree with. I said, yeah. I'm never going to be like you. Some people can do the, also that. Right. Yeah. It's harder. It's harder. It's harder, but it is right. possible. It is possible. Just because, you know, but it, but it shows. It shows the it shows the value of, uh, uh, but but there is a part that affected you, though. I mean, of if course. you think about it, it there's a part to. of that affected it you. Right. There's certain things in life that probably, how hard is it for you to find somebody right now that you want to make your wife? How hard is yeah, it for you? Yeah, because it's, it's, it's you're you're overthinking it. Like, what if it doesn't work? What if it's yeah. this? What if it's that? Because there's a part of that fear. Like, I don't want to ever get married. Mm -hmm. To me, it's like I'm never going to get married because, shit, I saw my parents get two divorces in yeah. 20 years. I don't even want to deal with this marriage stuff. But I really wanted to have kids and I wanted to have a family. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have that legacy type of thing, right? So, it it just tells you the power of parenting, man. Mm -hmm. It tells you the power of parenting. I had a friend of mine, his dad would always slap him in the face in front of us. Ooh. And the kids would, kid, I mean, and this was a grown kid. Yeah. His dad would slap him in the face. Man, I would walk away. I'm like, dude, I can't be in your house, man. I can't come to your house. He said, well, I can't watch your dad slap you in the face. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm not cool with that. It was very, very awkward to see that take place. And what happened I, with that guy? I, I, he's no longer with us, man. I just, no. You know, no, literally, he's no longer with us. So I think the value of parenting, man, that's the part where. Yes. Mm -hmm. You hear kids being raised without a father or without a, a, a mom and dad in a picture. It's got a big, uh, it's got a big influence on that. Uh, look, look, look at crime. Most of these kids in jail, eighty percent of them yeah. have no fathers. That's right. Where, where are the fathers? You know, when you get these kids eight, nine, ten years old, it's too late. You got to get them at that. You got to get them early. I, I go to prisons. I go to juvenile prisons, and I talk to some of the kids. Okay. It, 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 these kids are 14 years old. They're like men. They're like men. Yeah. They're talking about whacking people, double murders. Yeah. Come on. Where, where were the parents? Yeah. Where were the parents? Yeah. Where? His mother was a junkie. His father was a, a, in, in, the, in the can. Yeah. I mean, what shot does he have? Yeah. What shot does this kid have? No shot. Nothing. Uh, it's the, you must get these kids early. Purpose and accountability. What, you do, you, what do you do when the father... What, what do we do? Because... Look, we're a nation of choices, right? Freedom right. of choice. You get to choose to use a condom or not. Nobody can force you to say, wait, wait, right. wait, 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 put it on. Like, we're not mm -hmm. there to be able to catch that situation, right? Right. So there's a lot of uh, temptation when you're having sex. You know, you're not thinking about it. You get pregnant. Baby right. comes. 
father bills. Dude, I, I don't want to be a father. I just wanted to have some good sex. Right. I mean, I'm not I'm not here to help you. I don't even have any money. I can't do right. anything. I can't be in a picture. Mm-hmm. What do you do in those cases where the father's not there? How does the community, how does the state, how does the country address that? I don't know. Yeah. So that's a... You know, it's funny. I, I was... Um, Many years ago, I was at, at Spielberg's house, and I was talking to him about a project. I never forgot that. And a little boy came out. A little boy came out. Uh, black, he was black. Very beautiful hair, haircut. And he, had, he was only about 10 years old, maybe, I think, at the time. He had this, like, Ralph Lauren shirt, pants. I mean, really stylish. And he said, uh, and, and, and he said Chaz, this is my son. And Spielberg's went, son. Yes. Wow. And I said, oh, he has another son, Max, that he has one. And, and again, I'm not talking, I don't, I don't know Stephen, but I'm just telling you this story. And he said, this is my son. And I went, oh, very nice to meet you. And he was very, hello, really, you know. And then I, I said, wow. And, and I found out that he adopted him, mm-hmm. that his parents, I don't know, maybe they, I, think, I don't know if they, something, somebody said they were crack addicts. I don't remember exactly. But now here's this young boy, think of this, that if Stephen doesn't adopt him, where is he? Mm. And now he went from there to being one of the most influential, richest people in the world. How's his career going to be? It's, you know, Stephen's introducing him to life and... It's it's the parents mean everything in a young yeah. ch- child's life. Everything, people don't get it, but you got to get them early. You got to get them early. Chaz, last night when we left dinner and we uh, went to the house, we were talking. We went back to the house and we were there till about eleven thirty, twelve o'clock. Uh, we said, I said, I said, Chaz, Chaz, Chaz is a man's man. Okay, mm-hmm. that's what I see. He's a man's man. I come from a lineage of man's man. It's different when you are run man's man. The language is different. The right. swagger is different. The respect is different. The expectation is different. Things that don't matter to the average person is going to matter a little bit more to the man's man. There's certain things. You can't cross the line on certain right. things with them. There's certain things that's respect. Thoughts uh, uh, on uh, you with movies. Movies have a lot of power. Right. John Q was the first movie where I sat there and I said, man, that kid should have had a heart. Man, What are we going to do with this quarter million dollars that costs to get that heart? Like, what do we do with health insurance? There's, in, right. there's influence with movies, right? Last 20 years, men in movies are like, you know, b- b- presented as weak, fragile, pansies, softies, mm. you know, uh, being pushed around. You know, they're, they're a joke. They're a laughing stock. How much of this uh, uh, direction we're going and the way we're shaping and presenting how men are, are we losing the concept of man's man? Because today, masculinity is a little bit frowned upon. Mm. Like if you're, you're too much of a man's man, it's kind of like, well, that's not respectful. Well, that's not this. And you become almost a target. Toxic so how does a man's man today um, survive in an era where it's frowned upon to be a man's man? I, you know what? It's, it's a good question, Patrick. Uh, but people, you know, women complain about chivalry, and, and I, I sometimes I would say, "Well, you're the one who killed it." <laughs> you know, don't complain about it. You know, I remember I was trying to, I, I was on a, I was on a plane, and the, and the woman, uh, she had her stuff there, and yeah. it, it was kind of she was struggling to get it off the yeah. top, and I, I said, "Excuse me," I, I said, "I'll get it for you, honey." I, I just meant, I said, "Honey," yeah, and she said, "Excuse me." I could do it, and I'm not a honey. I said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, and she kind of yelled it, like, not yelled it, but people heard yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I was just, oh, okay, I'm sorry, and I was like, wow. I was trying to help her. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck, then. I, I didn't mean yeah. anything by that. I wasn't saying, hey, honey. I'll, I just said, no. oh, excuse me, honey, I'll, I'll get it for you, you know, as being a man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. she, like, jumped on my case, you know, I'm not your honey, yeah. and I could get it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, wow. Well, you being in Hollywood, what's your take on the Me Too movement, feminism? Well, you I'm know, curious to know if he goes deeper on that. Are you going to okay. go deeper on that? Because you're a pretty, pretty deep guy. Because I'm sitting there having a conversation, and I say, hey, ladies, can we do this? And we're at a restaurant, and say, hi, ladies. And one of the girls says, don't call me a lady. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what can I call you? Right. You, you just can call me a woman. I'm a woman. I'm not a lady. I said, so I step back. I'm like, I'm trying to see why. I said, can I ask you, just for my yeah, own curiosity, right. it says, mm-hmm. if I'm a lady, you're a lord. You're not a lord. I said, what? Oh, man. Yeah, but there's it's, nothing you could say yeah, to that. Yeah, so, I mean, you got to so, walk away. Yeah, you, I know. I did. I, yeah, I, I, you, I walked when I had my away. food. But the, 
The so, point is, you know, like you, 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 uh, 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 it's almost uh, you're a target today. That's all I'm saying. I, I, yeah. feel, I feel bad for those people, though, Pat, because it, it's a lot of it is coming from like internalized hatred and stuff that they don't, you know, it, it's, it's a way for them. I don't I think it's them, internalized. You don't think so? No, I don't think this it's internalized. This is a way for them to feel powerful in ways that they don't you, feel powerful and they're, they're you know, I'm just imagine having to go through life and everything has to be filtered through the lens of how can I make this about me? How can I make this about this offends me? You you should have known this would that's offend taught. me. Like, no, that's taught, bro. I, I'm sorry, I can't buy that. I think that is taught. There's no, we spent an hour and 30 minutes so far in this podcast talking about the value of somebody teaching you good or bad principles. Mm -hmm. And then he said 100% is parenting. I says, I don't know if it's 100% parenting. Let's say it's 90% parenting. Let's put the number on whatever ratios we yeah. want to use. I think that is taught through a generation, and you think it's normal. It's very simple. It's taught. And I, I have a, I'm having a hard time with that because for my kids, you know, one of my kids, uh, something happened was a bully, and they said, yeah, in, in school, this one school they were going to, in school, Daddy, they're telling us even if somebody hits you, never hit back. So I said, yeah, really? Yeah. I said, listen, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to call your teacher. So I called the teacher, and I went and met the school. I went and had everybody there. I said, so here's what I'm being told. I just want to manage expectation because we have to be on the same page. Because, you know, as teachers and uh, parents, we're on the same team. We're trying to raise good citizens, right? So yeah, of course. Yes, fi fantastic. I said, so this kid is bullying my son, okay? He's being told to just come and tell you guys. So he's being taught to snitch, which is fine. Okay, but I'm just trying to understand this. I said, is that what feedback he's being told? Yes. Now, what is the limit of uh, limitation you guys have here for how much he has to accept bullying until he punches back? No, we don't tolerate that. I said, okay, so we have a challenge here. Says, what's that? So because my kids come home and my kids are instructed that if somebody bullies you, respectfully, you tell them to stop, okay? And you address it. And then if it happens continuously, you have to punch him in the face. <laughs> that's a specific instruction. Now, somebody <laughs> may disagree with the sense that this is no. not the right way to do, right? You have to do in every possible way to avoid conflict. But you got to stand up. You got to stand up. And then they're going back and forth. Well, that's not the right way of parenting. I said, I'm sorry. I'm not going to raise little pansies. Yeah. I, because, here, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. When I went after my parents got a divorce and I lived in Germany and there was no father figure and it was me, my sister, and my mom, and they're both attractive. Yeah. The world is an ugly world. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be soft, they're going to devour you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you want me to raise kids that are going to be bullied the rest of their life? Yeah. Hell to the effing no. It's not going to happen, right? So that's the part where I'm asking because, you know, like imagine if your son hangs out with them for three months. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. No, honestly, I want you to actually think, but you got a kid, he hangs out with Chas for three months. What yeah. do you think happens to your son? <laughs> he comes smooth. Forget about being smooth. Yeah. He's going to learn the right way to he's, act. He's going to learn yeah. values and principles of what yes. it is to be a sure. man, right? Absolutely. That's the challenge I'm having. I, I, don't, I don't know right. if you have any I am, thoughts I am, on that. So, no, I, I am so proud of my son. I have a son, Dante, who's 25 years old. 6'2", like you know me, drop-dead handsome, built. Stud. Fud. He could fight. I, I taught him how to fight just like my dad taught me how to fight since he's three years old. Like I box or box. what? Dante box. versus Jake Paul right here on Value <laughs> Tamer. That, my son is – when we get off camera, I'll show you some things. My son could fight. and he could, and he and, But you know what? I always told him. I always said to him, Dante, when he was young, I'm teaching you how to fight so you don't fight. Remember that. I know, Dad. My son is a stand-up, graduated Berkeley. He'll, he'll walk away. But let me tell you something. But if you push it, he will he will put you out. He will MMA, you know, the whole yeah. thing. But you, all you have to do is build a reputation once. Yes. You have to, you have to teach a person to fight. You have yeah. to. If I have a son, if I had another son, I would teach him. And I and my grandfather taught my father, my father taught me, I taught my son, and my son will teach his kids. Now, Not just a boy, a, a girl too. No, and that's that's what I was gonna ask. On the other side of it, you guys are both fathers to daughters. So if somebody comes up, some, like somebody at school made an unwanted advance on your daughter and she came home, Dad, how do I handle it? What are you, what are you telling her? Well, I, I wanted to go to someone and tell them and see how they handle it, just like Patrick did. Mm -hmm. If they handle it the right way and say, hey, you did it once, you never do it again because if you do it, you're going to get expelled. Yeah. Then his boy doesn't have to worry. But if this boy keeps doing it and they mm -hmm. keep telling this kid you can't do anything back, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. That's, I grew up. Where a guy was a bully, yeah, you want to be a bully? Boom, let's go for it. Yeah, and you know what? It stopped. It was over. No mm -hmm. more bullying. Fights in the school. Yeah, yards. it only takes a couple times. The world, the, 
The world is an ugly place. People feed off you. You gotta, and if they see weakness, they keep it up. Mm -hmm. They keep it up. I had a thing a year ago. I don't get into fights anymore. I have two. I have two off-duty cops that travel everywhere with me, and they'll, they'll stop it. But this one guy, I was sitting, standing at the bar, and he came over to me. He goes, he goes, yeah, you were here three weeks ago. I saw you. You remember me? And I, and I did remember him because I was with a table, and he walked over and said, "Hey, I love your movies." And I said, "Thank you." And he pulls up a chair and sits down. I mean, you don't do that. And I said, excuse me, I'm, I'm with a party here. I, I thank you that you love my movies, but I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm with people. And he got up and left. So then three weeks later, he sees me. He comes, he goes, yeah, you dissed me last w a few weeks ago. I said, I what? He goes, you dissed me. I go, I, look, I was with a party and you came over. I'm sorry, you know. He goes, yeah, well, I didn't like that. And I could feel my, the guy who was with me holding my arm, my, one of my bodyguards. And he goes, wait, I go, I told him, just wait a second. I said, look, if I did do something, I apologize. I'm very sorry. I, didn't, I don't think I did, but if I did, I truly apologize. And he said, yeah, well, you know what? That's not enough. And I says, well, then I don't know what to tell you then. And he was a big guy, you know. And then he leans over to me at the bar, and he says, you know, I'm a fucking tough guy says this to me. So now, all of a sudden, I went way back in the street. I went, <laughs> all of a sudden, and I said, okay, I know what I'm dealing with now. I said, that's good. I said, because I'm a fucking tough guy too. So what do you want to do? And he looked at me, looked at me and went, come on, I'm key. And he went, I'm just ah! teasing. You know. Hey, man, oh, I really love your movie. I, you know, I said, all right, we're cool, man. And he walked away. He pushed me to the point where I had to show him, hey, man, you want to play? Make your move. Let's go. Until I did that, until I did that, mm -hmm. he would have kept going. Yeah. How long ago was this, by the way? About a year ago. A year ago. A year ago. No, I thought he said three weeks now, ago. You, you brought yeah. up, uh, you, you reminded me of a story, wow. man. It's about I was a year in, ago. Um, Respect, Chaz. No, no, it, but it's not, it's just, come on, guys. Yeah. Yeah. That's enough. It, do everything you can to avoid the fight. You know, in the school, you hope to have a law and order where it doesn't even come to you. Some schools do great, but the kids are going to the school right now. We had an incident. They didn't even make it up to me that I, need, I didn't need to go to school. They handled it themselves. See, yeah. see I, 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 was, I was taught wrong, man. <laughs> like, you guys are right, but I was taught wrong. My, uh, I'll never forget, I was in first grade, and uh, there was a kid named Matt, and he was, uh, he was, he was kind of a bully. My mom was a, the lunch, uh, what, what were they called? Like, they come and they like... The lunch yeah. lady? Well, yeah. lunch lady, but yeah. they like... Uh, lunch lady land? Wasn't a lunch lady. They like... Uh, Cafeteria worker? No, they like chaperone during recess or whatever, like, uh, whatever. So this, the, the guy calls him... Uh, he, my mom tells the kid to st stop doing what he's doing. He was like pinching a girl or something like that. And my mom was like, Matthew, stop. And he goes, shut up, bitch, to my mom. And wow. I was like, oh, like you don't do that to my mom. Like my mom's a warrior woman, dude. Like, oh. And then I come home. My dad's never home. He worked in the city. He was home at 8 o'clock at night. When I come home, my dad's waiting for me at home. and goes, hey, did Matt call your mom a bitch today at school? I was like, yeah, I can't believe it. He goes, what'd you do? I was like, I know that. He was like, okay. This is what you're going to do. As soon as you get off the bus tomorrow, you're going to walk up to Matt. You're going to punch him in the face. You're going to keep punching him until you can't punch anymore. And I'm like, I don't think I'm allowed to do that. He goes, you're allowed to do that. Go do that. So first thing, I get off the bus in the morning. I go, and I punch this kid. I beat, I beat the living crap out of him. I'm crying while I'm on top of him the whole time. I obviously get dragged to the principal's office. The principal's like, what the heck was that about? I was like, ah, he called my mom a bitch. So my dad's there, obviously called out of work. <laughs> He's there. He goes, Gerard, I am so disappointed in you. This is not how I'm like sitting there like shocked. Like, what the <laughs> f What just happened here? He comes out and he goes, hey, free day off. And he pounds me. We go get ice cream. He takes me to a Yankee game that night. <laughs> he was like, look, man, sometimes. There's a, there's a, sometimes. Part, of, there's a part of that that's not, he, he, that your dad didn't do you wrong there. There's a no. part of that that's kind of like. You know, he, he taught you to protect your mom and your two sisters. You got two yeah. sisters, yeah. right? Probably yeah. was a better way to go about it. No, I'm not saying, listen, there's not, the one thing about parenting that sucks is there's no freaking manual. You know, you, <laughs> you can say the Bible, yes, yes. There's a, but there's not a manual that says, if this thing happens, what do you do? Go to page 396 to right. see seven yeah. steps on how to handle this. You yeah. kind of got to freaking mm -hmm. go off the cuff. He, uh, he was so legitimately mad at me that he had to teach me that lesson. He was uh, like, you uh, didn't think? Uh, uh, Chaz, a guy just, uh, Jack Hasso. Uh, uh, posted a question here. 
about Lilo Brancato. I've heard you talk about him before when he got in trouble himself yeah. because he was a star coming up at a young age and yeah. he didn't know how to handle it. Good looking guy. Mm. He does a movie like Bronx Tale. He's partying. He's everywhere. Right. Women are all, all over him. What happened to him? He's out right now. I know he's out, but yeah. what happened with his story? What happened was he, you know, he, he, he was 16 years old. I mean, it was too much too soon, you know. And he believed all the, uh, the press reviews and everything, and he just acted terrible and got involved with drugs. He became a junkie, and, and it was funny because as the years were going on, I used to say to him, I said, Lilo, you were in the quintessential movie about not wasting your life. And that's exactly wasted talent. And that's exactly what you're doing. Wow. I said, Do you realize that? You're 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 living the movie. Yeah. And what was his response? No, nah, no, I'm gonna be cool. I'm gonna be cool. Yeah. Three weeks before it happened, he came to my house because he wanted me to do a movie, write a movie about this guy, and he was stoned. I said, Lilo, it's gonna happen sooner or later. Three weeks later, a big report on the news that a cop died, was shot, he was with the guy, and that was it. Oof. Are you still in touch with him? No, I don't speak to him anymore. Mm. I tried for 10 years to talk to him, and now I look, he's a talented kid. He could have been a big star, but my friendship is over with him. But I wish him well. I, I hear he straightened his life out. I think that's great. I hear he helps kids. I think that's great. And I wish him well. How, Did you look at him as a son at some point? Or? No. Okay. No. Chaz, how, how often does that happen? Where do you see like mm. a not being able to manage the limelight? Is, is there what comes with the limelight? I mean, when you get the lime, can, okay. So for example, you you're doing broad, you're doing uh, uh, theater, right? You're doing all this and great. Right. There, how many people are in the audience, by the way? Five hundred thousand, ten thousand, five thousand. Yeah, no, uh, most twenty five, three thousand. Let's say twenty five hundred to three thousand people. Mm. There's a big difference between twenty five hundred to three thousand to fifty million people watching the yeah. movie, right? It's a big, big difference. What happened the moment Bronx Tale became a hit and you were nominated for the Academy? It's, what happens to your life? What happened overnight to it your was, life? It was amazing. Can I, you walk I, us through I, I that? Was totally, I was totally unknown. I was an actor, but I was totally unknown. The next minute, I remember we were flying, we're flying to Paris. Uh, I'm on a private jet with Bob. And we're flying to Paris, and he's sleeping in one bed, and I'm sleeping in the other, and I wake up. And I just looked at him, sleeping there. I look out the window, you know, blackness, and I went, wow. And here I was, like, months before, just, mm -hmm. and now I'm on a private jet with Bob yeah. De Niro, you know? And I got up, I'll never forget it, and there was a guy just sitting there reading. He was like the butler, you know? And I said, do you have any, I was a little hungry. I said, do you have any, like, um, you know, finger food or something like that? I'm a little hungry. You know, I was never on a private jet before. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, well, what would you like to eat? You want some pancakes or French toast or something? And I was like, oh, uh, uh, pancakes, French toast? I'll make, you, uh, I'll make you an omelet, you know, and I'm like. Uh, I get some salted peanuts, some pretzels. Uh, I, that's what I, I, I want the salted peanuts. Cookie, or something. cookie right? He goes, no, no. All of a sudden he opens up the table. He puts the white table yeah. floor. He puts a rose there on a thing. And like, you know, sets this beautiful table up. I'm sitting there and he's cooking and he's making me pancakes and I'm eating scrambled eggs and I'm looking I'm eating and I look over and Bob is sleeping and I go all right Chaz I go but you belong here but I said that to myself I said you belong here it's okay yeah. mm. uh, but that was one that was a moment it's funny you brought that up Patrick that was one of the first moments that I was like yeah wow you and then we got off the plane in France in Paris and there was this giant giant wall with Bob's face and my face looking at each other it's that poster you know? yeah and I was like Pull up the poster, by the way. That's one of the yeah, sickest yeah, posters. Yeah. yeah. I'll forget when that. you interviewed Mike Tyson, yeah, and he was the world champion, and and, and you asked the question, which is giving me sort of vibes like yeah. this. You said, "When did you know you would yeah, be the champion?" It. And he says, uh, "What was his response when he was 14 years old?" You sometimes yeah. you have to be the you champion. You have to. Th you have to believe you're a champion before you become a champion. Yes. There's yeah. a lot of similarities there. Is that basically yes. how you knew you would there's be a, this there's, there's famous a, there's actor? There's a saying. You have to go there in the mind mm -hmm. before you can go there physically. Mm. You know, uh, and it's like when people train, like Navy SEALs, why they train so much. And when they get into the shit, they're there already because yeah. they trained it. Yeah. In there. They're there. So you have to go there in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, so I always already pictured myself working with great people. Hmm. And At what age did, I that, saw, did that mindset uh, start? Uh, God. 
I wanted to be an actor at 10, probably in my, you know, 11, 12, 13. So when you're 38 and that $250,000 no, check comes, you're no. thinking, no, I, I'm, I'm going to hold out. The only person, am. the only person that I ever got starstruck, and I worked with all of them, the biggest stars, the only person who I could never get over who he was, yeah. was Frank Sinatra. Wow. wow. That's the only one. You've been on set with Sofia Vergara, not starstruck even a little no, bit. No, Sofia Loren. No, she's a beautiful person. Yeah, well, what was the interaction Sophia with Sinatra? Sofia Vergara oh. is not Sofia Loren. No, it's a very big yeah, exactly. difference. Exactly. Sinatra, every time I was with him, I would just kind of just put my head down and go, Frank Sinatra, man. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't yeah. get over. I just couldn't get wow. over who he was. He was the only one because he was like, to me, you know, I, it's the famous. It's a famous story. I told it on a Tonight Show, and it's in a book. It's, and that's when we were sitting there. We were, everybody went inside, and I was at a barbecue at Frank's house this one time. I'm sitting there with him, and all of a sudden he goes, uh, "Hey, Chaz, you know Bronx Tale is one of my favorite movies." I said, "Oh, thanks, Frank." He goes, "It was a great movie." I said, "Thanks, Frank." He goes, "You know why it was a great movie?" And I'm like, "Why, Frank?" He goes. Because I didn't fucking fall asleep. That's all. <laughs> uh, this is what he said. Same so, with Pat. So then he goes to me. He goes, uh, and we're talking and we're having a great time. And he's got he's got a martini with two olives in it. Did I ever tell you this? Story? No. So he takes the he takes the two pick out with the two olives and at the end and and, and he goes, Chess, come on, share my olive. And I said, What? He goes, Go ahead, take the olive, share it with me. So I, I didn't know what he was doing. So I took the olive off the two pick, and he goes, You ready? I go, Yeah. And we pop the olives in our mouth. And he hugs me and goes, I love you, man. You're a good kid. You know, you always welcome to come around. Frank you know. Sinatra. Frank yeah. Sinatra. Wow. What a ridiculous so I said, story. So I said, well, thanks, Frank. He goes, come on, let's go inside. Everybody's eating, waiting for us. I said, all right, we walk inside. And everybody's, you know, serving. They're serving a, a, a smorgasbord of food. And all of a sudden, I, I go up to uh, Don Rickles. Oh, my God. Rickles. Don Rickles was what? there with oh my uh, God. Stephen E.D. Gourmet, Don Rickles. De Niro was there, and a couple of other, I think Sean Connery was there too. So I walk over there and I, and I go. <laughs> His name just come out of your mind. Yeah, and I go over there and I go, hey, I go, what's with this, with this, this olive thing? Frank just never did that before to I me. Mean, what, what's that about? Right? And I hear a voice behind me go, Frank, shed an olive with you. And I turn around and it's Gregory Peck. Gregory Peck, the f great actor. Mm -hmm. and they were best friends, him and Frank. So I said, yeah, what, what's this, this olive thing? He goes, that's a sign of great friendship, Chaz. The Rat Pack would share their olives together after mm -hmm. they drank martinis. And it's a sign of being a bond yeah, together. Oh he goes, if Frank did that with you, welcome to the club. Wow. That's incredible. I, I was blown away. That's incredible. I was blown away. What an experience. How, how did you handle that light? Because sometimes when you go from overnight and now the world knows who you are. That's a that's dramatic. That's not a little bit. You know how no, do you how I, do you how do you I manage just, that? I just managed it. You know, I just managed. I look. Was it hard sometimes? Yes. Did, 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 sometimes you just got to go. You know, okay, I'm cool. You know, I'll, I'll be all right. You know, uh, you just gotta. You know, I don't forget. I was 38, 40, so I wasn't a kid. Mm -hmm. Anybody who makes it under the age of twenty or thirty is is insane. Yeah. So I was already seasoned, but even me, even at my age, it, it was still like, you know, all of a sudden you you have you know all these people want something from you, you know. I was always you know I I I, I always had girls, so it wasn't like I never had girls before, you know. But it's just this constant level of women, and and money and people and. And what which saved Sounds me? Horrible. Which saved yeah. me was no. Uh, what, believe me, what saved me was I, I had a beautiful. I met a beautiful girl, mm -hmm. my wife, and I got married right around the time Bronx Tale was coming out. So people go, my friends go, oh, "What are you crazy? You're getting married? <laughs> are you out of your mind?" Yeah. You know. And I said, "Look, man, I've had a lot of pretty girls. I've gr I grew up. I've had a lot of women in my life. You know." Do you believe in the in the three great women in your life? Oh, no question, no question. I believe that. You know. I mean, that's one of my things. That that's how I wrote it in. Look, think about it. How many times have you felt? Think about it. How well, you know, you guys are younger. How many times have you fell in love in your life? Think about it. Once, twice, twice, yeah. maybe twice. That's it. Three times. Three three times is like forget it. 
You only get three. You Adam's know. once a week, by the way. Every week, somebody <laughs> knew he's in love. The yeah. banter. He just loves true. banter. Adam, you got to <laughs> listen to my podcast because I talk about this whole <laughs> thing about, Chaz, about I'm, love. I'm going to listen to that. Sh- well, Sandy Blue Eyes. Come on. Of course. No, no. So they, they come around every 10 years like great fighters. But, like, but, uh, yeah, exactly. But here's the thing about that is yes, could you have all the women in the world? But some of the biggest ladies' men in the world are very lonely. Yeah. You know, very lonely. Mm. You know, Happiness is, is marriage and meaning of family and being mm-hmm. with, you know, look, is it hard? Yeah, but that's the way life is. Chaz, what is the modern day door test? In the movie, you yeah. said, you know, I'm, you're going to do the test. She and, orders the Uber. Okay. <laughs> no, the mo- <laughs> and, and she goes, oh, the, and they go, oh, the, the modern goes, day, the modern yeah, day door test is, as soon as, the, as soon as the door closes, <laughs> she has to get the automatic thing on, the, on her side and hit it a few times. Yeah, so the go. button goes click, click, yeah. click, click, click. <laughs> now, in the old days, you have to lift now, it up. Yeah, but now they, she has to But now with social now, media and dating yeah. apps. I got to tell you, as, as comedians, you know, Don Rickles is, 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 is as good as it gets. And you talked about Frank Sinatra. One of the funniest stories I ever heard, Don Rickles talking about right. marriage. He's like, he was explaining, I believe it was to Carson, how he fell in love with his wife. And I guess he was married for a very long time. So he finds this girl he's madly in love with, and he's begging Frank Sinatra. He's like, Frank, I got this girl. It's a great really, story. I really want to make it with. Yeah. I want to make it with yeah. this girl. Yeah, sure. I told you this story. You're the one who told me the story? Yes. He's like, you got, you got to come. You, you want to take the story? Wow, okay, sure. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. fine. He says, uh, Frank, you're the biggest star in the world. Right. Uh, do me a favor. I'm going to have dinner with this girl. And just come by and say hi. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I'm not going to come by. I'm not going to do on, this, Frank, Don. Come on, Frank. Frank, please, come on. Have a little respect. Yeah. I want to I wanna help me make out it, here, Help buddy. me out here. Yeah. Fucking Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Don, listen, I'm not coming over to your table. It's like, just leave me alone. Don, please. All right. Okay, Don Rickles, I'll come. So Frank shows up. 10 o'clock. Up. Don't be late. Yeah, 10 o'clock. Exactly. He's, he sets it up. I'll be with the girl. And he's like, all right, uh, Frank Sinatra, I'll come over to your table and say hi. And Frank Sinatra comes over to Don Rickles' tables. Hey, Don, how you doing? Don goes, Frank, I'm having dinner here. <laughs> have a little Frank respect. Cried. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Interrupting my dinner. That's him. And that's, uh, he's like, set, <laughs> he yeah. set Frank Sinatra yeah. up. Yeah. You kidding me? It's, no, it's no, like the best Don Rickles story was, ever. Oh, oh, I can tell you, I can tell you Rickles stories. He says to yeah. me, he goes, you know, Frank's three wives were all named Joanne. Wow. This, I, I didn't know that. He goes, you know, Frank. He goes, you know, my Frank picks always doing. He goes, cheap bastard doesn't want to change the bed towels. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jay Carson, Jay Carson. So he goes, let me tell you something, child. Oh, I could, I could go on. This he is goes, Rickles. This is Rickles. He, goes, he was one of a kind, by the way. The Rickles goes to me. He goes, you know, Rickles saved my life. You know, Sinatra says this. Uh, no, R- Rickles is saying Sinatra saved, oh, saved really? my life. Rickles is telling me. I said, really? He goes, yeah. I said, uh, fr- I said, Don, are you serious? He goes, save my life. I said, what happened? He goes, 1967, in front of Caesar's Palace. Three guys stopped beating me over the head with baseball bats. Beating the shit out of me. Frank walks out and says, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez Louise, man. And you played Vegas for, you were in Vegas for how long? Oh, eight, seven, eight years I was in Vegas. Seven, eight years, yeah. man. He goes to me, he goes to me, he goes, is Frank big? Is Frank, he, Frank's, Frank's over there, he goes, is Frank big? Frank's so big, look at him. He wears a cross with nobody on it. <laughs> you know, like, a, you know, a cross, nobody on I mean, I mean, Rickles is, the first day I met him, the first time I met yeah. Don Rickles was at Sinatra's house. The first time I met him. I walk in and, and De Niro introduced me. He goes, he goes, this is Don Rickles. And De Niro looks at me right in front of everybody. Everybody's standing. He goes, hey, Josh Palmateri, where the fuck would you be without Robert De Niro? <laughs> he says that. Says that. <laughs> Chaz, do you have like a Mount Rushmore? Gotta love that. First thing. Do you have a Mount Rushmore of people that are the icons? Like obviously Frank Sinatra's probably Frank Sinatra, on. yeah. Is there anybody else? Like is De Niro on that list? Is oh, Rick, yeah. Who's yeah. on Chaz Palmateri's Mount no, Rushmore? I mean, yeah, you know, of course De Niro, you know. Bob's yeah. the greatest actor of our generation, you know, who knows, maybe of all time, I don't know. But uh, De Niro, I mean, what a great artist. But De Niro, Sinatra, uh, yeah, Italians. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I would say, yeah, they happen to be Italians. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you talking about Brando DiMaggio? last night, but you talking about Brando, oh, Brando. I didn't, I didn't meet Brando, so I can't, you know, I, I was supposed to go and to his house, I'll never forget it. Sean Penn asked me, he says, hey, well, I'm meeting with, with Marlon tonight, do you want to come? And I was getting on a plane. I should have just turned around 
and walked off the damn thing, but I didn't. I said, no, I'm getting on a plane. Yeah, Sean Penn it. asked you to go to Marlon Brando's house. The plane can wait, you know? I should have did it. But let me, let me ask. You should have done a couple things. I should have, yeah. I'm going to ask two current events. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask two current event questions and see what you think about okay. this. Okay. Scarlett Johansson is suing Disney. Okay, what it means to Hollywood's future, right? Scarlett Johansson and Disney are embroiled in the legal battle. You know, it's not looking pretty, you know, because the movie went straight. And, you know, Johansson uh, also allegedly that Disney's decision to release the film in the current environment robbed her $50 million in box office. Similar thing is happening also with the, uh, what do you call it? With the, the Many Saints of Newark. Yeah, uh, David so Chase and, the uh, Many Saints of Newark, which is like, hey, why are we not going into movies and Sopranos all this stuff? Prequel, yeah. what, what is changing about Hollywood right now, especially since COVID? Because a lot of guys are like, we're not going to go into theater. We're just going straight to streaming service. Yeah. What's changed with Hollywood? Well, it's faster. It, you know, the, instead of just showing it so the movie runs. Well, think about it. How many people are going to see it in the movie? you got to show it at what? 3,000 screens and it's first of all that movie wasn't like that you know you don't know how many people could see it but if you see it online and put it out there for the world to see it's a big difference but now but it but the salary has to act accordingly to that and they didn't catch up you know we're not caught up with the media yet you know we're not um, the big actors have to work it out I you know you get not many people get 20 million dollars to, to do a movie you know it's only a few Leo does it and Denzel, they get twenty million, but if they're going to say you're going to stream it to the world, now you're going to say, all right, give me my twenty million, but then I want a piece of that whole stream. Mm -hmm. They haven't worked that out yet. Got it. So that's still being worked. I mean, they'll figure it out. They'll it's figure still... it out, but that hasn't been worked out yet. Yeah. Interesting. Who's winning more right now, the studio or the actor? Oh, the right now the actors. Okay. The actors, because look, here, here's the deal. Years ago, when I growing up, you had Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 7, you know. All, all of a sudden now, it's a big difference now. Now they're shaking in their boots because, look, you have your own podcast. You get 2 million people, 3 million people. I have my own podcast. You have subscribers. You have a channel. You actually have a channel. Mm -hmm. You know, Patrick has a channel. You guys have a channel. You know, PD Podcast has a channel. How many subscribers? Millions. How many, you know how many people see The Tonight Show? A million, maybe. A million and a half see it every night. You know, that's all. So you're out, you're out doing them. So they're shaking in their boots saying, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here yeah. now? Right. A lot of these guys, a lot of these stand-up co comics, they don't want to go on uh, to HBO, Netflix. You know what they do? They put their own channel up. Louis C.K. Right. did it. Put his own channel up, signed money, Boom. He gets all the money. Well, back in the day, the, the biggest honor ever were to go on Carson. It was Carson. It's Carson. But and then know, it maybe turned into Leto right. Letterman, and now right. it's Rogan. Right. Exactly. Now, that's, now what, you, that's the now biggest you thing. You can get your own channel now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's changed. The, it's the, crazy. It's to gone. Think about that. It's gone towards the artist now. If the artist is smart, he's a good entrepreneur. Is this a good or bad doing. thing? I think it's a good thing. Okay. I it's think an it's evolution. I mean, be, I think it's an evolution. Yeah. I think you bring up a good point. Whether it's a good or bad thing, it's a thing now. Oh, it's not. It's not it's going not, away. It's not going away. It's yeah. Here. I mean, Ricky Gervais said, "Listen, all this stuff with movies, we may as well just yeah. give all the trophies to Netflix because they're taking <laughs> out. They're yeah. taking everything, right? They yeah. One by one by one. Uh, 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 mob movies. When's the last time we had a good mob movie? Like something where you can say like a. Bronx Tale, like a good yeah, fella stop. We of haven't casino. had one in a while. Yeah, why do you think it's been a while? They're well, because series, it's hard to make a good one. That it's hard to make mm. one that hasn't been done before. The Departed you know? with Leo and uh, yeah, but it's I hard to make those. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> excuse me, but it's hard to make those movies now. It's hard. People go, ah, who wants to see another mom movie? Mm -hmm. Unless it's really great, then they want to see it. But I think I think you have to push the envelope and, and try new different things. You know. I really believe that. That's why I like independent movies. I've always liked independent movies. More people can make movies now for less, less money. Yeah. We, we yeah. have a guy in-house, Zach Parker, uh, produced an independent film, actually won at uh, Sundance. So. Who's Zach Parker? Uh, he's a guy, he's a guy. No, no, I know. If he, he watches guy, this, he's yeah. going to understand my joke. But, Just tell uh, the yeah. people where they can see um, your show. Yeah. The one-man right. show, everything. I'm We're, still doing the one-man yeah. show after all these years. I do it if they go to chazpalmentary.net. That is my website. Uh, you, you can buy tickets. You could see I'm booked for this this year and next year. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys are going to come and see me when yes, I'm down. No, here. We'll be, we we're will. taking a field trip. Do yeah. you have any final questions from him on ladies? Any specific tips? Because, <laughs> you know, here's a man. He tells us he wants to have a family one day. He yeah, tells yeah, us. Yeah. Okay. He tells I us. Do. Well, how old are you now? I'm 40. 
Oh, you're 40. Wow, yeah. you look a lot younger. Thanks, Chaz. Yeah. I appreciate that. No, you Can make a short You just clip made his month. <laughs> you no. made his month. <laughs> no. Well, here's how you got to look at it. Here's what I tell people. You know, if you had a job and you made a lot of money each week, you made five thousand dollars, ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars a week. It's a nice salary, but that ten thousand dollars a week, that whole week you blew it. You mm-hmm. just spent it all. Well, let's that's just say, not what I do. Oh, let's just Save say that money. But yeah, let's just course. say you blew it. You blew it. But think of the think of the money as its emotions. Mm. You blew the five thousand each week. Boom! You blew it a little. Boom! Blew, blew it. Blew it. And at the end of your lifetime, you got no money in the bank. You got nothing but you. But now think of it as uh, emotions if you meet a great woman. And each week, you're putting that money in the bank. What is that money? It's memories. Your children, your wife, your family. And at the end of your lifetime, you're going to have all these riches of, of a moment. You're not going to – the one guy's going to have no money in the bank emotionally, and the other guy's going to be rich emotionally. Wow. So when you pass on, which we all will, when you're on your deathbed and you, you have a wife and great kids, that you go, hey, man, it's cool. As opposed to just living for pleasure and not happiness. Mm-hmm. Is it hard? Yes, it is. Do I still struggle with it? Yes, I do. We're just works in progress. That's all we are. But it's the ones who have the discipline mm-hmm. are the ones who, in the end, are happy. True. You're so cool, Chaz. I yeah. gotta tell you, man. And also, you know, I gotta tell you too, man. Like watching, watching the way, you're, like your your relationship in particular, the way you and Jen are, man. It, mm-hmm. it, it, uh, it it's changed my view on marriage, really. And I, I told you guys last night, and this is not a bit. This is me being for real. I want to be a father. I just, I, I really have no interest in being a husband at this point in my life. I just, and I know well, that the, the key like, word right there is at this point yeah, in life. But the more you don't I, have to well, do you know it what, at man? this point. Yeah, in life, you know what? I, I've never really seen a partnership the way I see a partnership with you guys, and I see it's like mm-hmm. the value in that attracts me. You know, the value in having someone that has your back as you get older attracts you. You know, because you know you never really needed that like emotional. Um, you know, th- I never needed that sanctuary. I always had my friends. I always had my boys. Now, as I'm getting older, man, yeah. they, they're, those guys are coming off. They're starting their own families, and you do feel a little bit more alone. And you can definitely see the value of it. It's for in, sure. you know, it's in the DNA. Look, here's here's the deal. The problem is, men are were born to procreate. Yeah. Uh, no, excuse me. Procreate. <clears throat> yeah. Procreate. And women. Men are attracted to aesthetics, beauty. Yeah. You see with the woman. eyes, visual. With, with the eyes. You Adam see a beautiful loves woman. Banter. You go, oh, wow. From beautiful right. women. W- women are attracted to power. Mm-hmm. And that comes from the caveman. Right. You know, they, they took the biggest caveman, the most handsome caveman, because the, they wanted to be with him, because they knew they were going to eat. Yeah. I'm with this guy. I'm eating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This guy's going to make sure That's I get Putin fed. Putin is consistently the you sexiest know what I'm saying? man in and Russia. And he Putin. wanted to be with the most beautiful girl. I want to have kids. Yeah. And that's in our DNA. That's printed there. So every once in a while, you're married, but you see a beautiful woman, you go, oh, man, Jesus. Oh, oh boy. It takes discipline, man. Mm. It takes discipline. And women, you know, why do you say, I see so many beautiful women with ugly guys. But they're not thinking about it. They're thinking of the, the power. Mm. Hey, I'm with this or guy. Or the money. And the money. Well, the money, yeah. yeah the well, that's part of the power. You get the yeah, money, you provider. get the power. So, but that's in our respect. DNA, and we have to fight that yeah. all the time, both of us. Both races. Women, men have to fight all of that both the time. I'm with my husband. Yeah, he, well, he's a bus driver. But, gee, this other guy's a lawyer. Man, man I don't know. You know, it's always this. Everybody goes through this, man. I think what he's trying to tell you is find a Russian woman. That's what <laughs> no. I won't talk about that. <laughs> uh, we won't go yeah. there, but. We won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, if you guys thought this podcast was fun, <laughs> which it clearly was, dinner last night. Dinner was last night. Everybody's, yeah. everybody's yeah. watching, yeah. saying, why the hell are they laughing as yeah. hard as they're laughing? Yeah. Anyways. Thank it, you for it, all the stories, If you Chaz, enjoyed the amazing. podcast, go click on Chaz's podcast below. We got the link below. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ch- uh, Kai, put it in the comment section as well as the chat, live chat section if you can. Uh, go subscribe to his channel. He's got a bunch of great stories to share. Uh, uh, with you a ton of it and um, he, he explains clips he brings different people there but if you haven't yet subscribed to his channel please do so more short clips will be coming out on our value team and short clip channel uh, having said that Chaz thank you so much for coming out and thank being you. a guest a man. this was great really was great. enjoyed really it really great thank yes. you. Awesome. have a good one take thank care you. all right I can't-